uh, council is welcome. Can you please stand? Almighty God, we the representatives of the, of the citizens of the city of Brisbane are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to our elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Councillors, are there any apologies? There are no apologies. Councillors, the confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,626th meeting held on Tuesday, 18 August 2020, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the minutes of the 4,626th meeting of Council held on the 18th of August 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Are there all those in favour say aye? Aye. And those against no? The ayes have it. Councillors, we have a public participant today. He's Mr. Robert Absalom. Mm -hmm. uh, can he please be admitted to the room? Welcome, Mr. Absalom. Uh, you'll be addressing us today for a period of five minutes that begins when you begin. Uh, please proceed, Mr. Absalom. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Robert Absalom. I'm a 72 year old pensioner. The reason I am here is because I received a parking fine um, from parking in a loading zone. Um, I deliver flowers for a florist, and when I initially started with them, um, I, I questioned her about where what I do with parking, and she. Uh, can I see that? Um, I was given this, which it just states florist courier delivery service, which I put on the dash of my car. Plus, I also have a disability um, sticker as well, so it's very difficult to be able to walk long distances. I've been doing this now for, for almost two years, and in the two years, I have never never received a parking fine. I have parked in loading zones where I've had to go to um, high buildings here in the city. Um, for instance, even just the other day, up to the 75th uh, floor of the 111... Um, uh, oh, Eagle Street? Eagle Street. So... I had to park a distance because I, I'm starting to get a bit worried about this this whole thing. I spoke to other courier drivers. They've, they've told me they've never ever received a parking uh, infringement. The infringement I received was, was at, at Cooperu outside Woolworths where I had to do a delivery inside the shopping centre and outside the uh, the shop there is only room for five, for five cars, three for private and two for, for commercial. The privates were taken up so I parked in the commercial. I put my um, sign on, on the dashboard. I went in, I took the flowers in, had to locate the person, came out and I actually never realised I had the ticket until later that night. Um, so the next day I went to um, your office in Roma Street and the gentleman in there was quite rude. So in the end I went to, I rang uh, Councillor Cunningham's office and uh, the gentleman that works for her, Ian, has been extremely helpful to me. He has sent um, uh, let us off uh, regarding this incident and then it was rejected so it, we appealed and with that I took photographs of my vehicle with, with the flowers in the back also uh, when the when there was no flowers showing all the, the implements inside the, the car and even on another occasion where I had to go and pick up um, pots and etc and a lot of times I will have to go to so to um, Broccoli and pick up flowers, etc., like that. So I am actually a courier service, and even though my car is, is only a, a small Holden Barina, I did notice that when I when I took, I, I looked up on um, the internet, it states that if you have your back seats down, well, I can't have them down because That's okay. I, need, I need to be able to stabilise uh, um, the the implements to. So to keep the, the flowers from moving around so nothing is damaged. The reason I am here is I just think this, this fine is unfair um, because I'm doing a service to the public, especially now 
where there's a lot of people in isolation. So people are sending people flowers. I, I go to um, hospitals, I go to uh, aged care centres. Um, there's every chance I, could, I could, could catch the virus, et cetera. I try and eliminate that by carrying um, hand sanitizer and masks, et cetera. But the main reason why I'm here is because surely there, there must be some way of getting around this for people like myself that are doing, we're doing a service. And, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I am a courier driver. It doesn't matter what size my car is. It even states here where I've turned around and printed a couple of things out, which the, the zoning rules, etc. And it states that even the passenger vehicles are allowed to stand in loading zones, but not park for no more than two minutes when picking up or dropping off passengers, or for no more than five minutes if they are picking up or dropping off a disabled person. Um, I also noticed too that they that um, it doesn't really state what a commercial vehicle looks like. Now, the reason why um, this the, the last delivery I did is I live in Camp Hill and I'd always try and do my last deliveries closer to home. So that was the last delivery. So after that, the car was, had no more flowers in it. Whether that's the reason why the gentleman decided to book me, I don't know. But I just think because I'm a service and... As I said, I've sent the photographs off and all, and all I got back was a letter stating, given the information above, the infringement notice will not be withdrawn. Well, um, Mr Absalom, uh, your time has expired. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I please invite Councillor Marks to respond? Thank you, Mr Chair. Yes, good afternoon, Mr Absalom, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to address Council. It's unfortunate that you're not able to address Chambers in person, but as you can imagine, it's an evolving situation. So um, we just have to do what we can. And today it's um, by Zoom. My name is Kim Marks and I'm the Chair of City Standards Community Health and Safety. So many of the officers that you've no doubt dealing with and disputing your infringement all work with what we call the CAR section, Compliance and Regulatory Services Branch. And that's an area of my portfolio. Having been notified of your attention to address the Chamber, I did take the liberty of looking into the circumstances surrounding your parking infringement and the, the reviews that you have requested. Now, I must emphasise from the very outset that as a councillor, I am unable to involve myself in the independent infringement appeals and review process, nor is the Lord Mayor. That is why, specifically, we have an independent disputes commissioner. What I do in my role as chair of the relevant portfolio is to look at the circumstances of your infringement and take on everything that you've said this afternoon and see if there's a broader issue um, that requires addressing such as due process that is followed. So, Mr. Abthon, while I can appreciate your frustration at receiving a parking fine, I do have to advise you that I'm very comfortable with the way Council, as an organisation, has dealt with this matter. You mark, your vehicle was marked in an area clearly signed as a commercial loading zone. And I noticed that in your request for a review of the infringement, you are happy to acknowledge this. Also, I noticed you said today you have been doing this for two years. So I would suggest um, that if you're doing it with two years without a fine, you've obviously been extremely lucky. Um, but what you've said is regard delivering flowers in connection with a commercial business, that you shouldn't have received a fine or at least shouldn't have to pay it. Well, I'm sorry to inform you, Mr. Absalom, but commercial loading zones exist because they're necessary to retain, maintain commercial vulnerability throughout the city. And when I say the city, I mean the CBD and the suburbs. You know, council regularly receives complaints from users of authorised commercial vehicles because they're unable to access loading zones. And as you can imagine, during this COVID time, when the Lord Mayor very kindly removed all parking metres from across the whole city and suburbs, um, people were parking anywhere and everywhere, including in commercial zones, which, as you can imagine, for the people who are out trying to do their day-to-day -day business and earn a living, uh, it was very frustrating for them. But um, when we did turn the metres back on again, including those commercial zones, people were given fair warning that was happening as well. Um, it, and the reality is the parking fine has nothing to do with the type of vehicle that you're driving or anything like that is what you've mentioned. Um, it's more about what the use of that vehicle is. So um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is an application for a commercial license, and that's what I would suggest that you apply for. 
um, potentially if your employer who gave you the wrong information in the first place and said that you could just stick a sign in your window saying you're a commercial deliverer, maybe you could approach them and ask them if they would consider paying that application for you for you. As I've said, it's $49.25. And the reason we require those vehicles to have a permit is so that we can identify which vehicles are parking in a loading zone for commercial vehicle and which not. And a handwritten note in the window, I'm sorry, Mr. Absalom, just doesn't cut it. Every, anyone could do that and we would have no way of knowing. It is exactly why we have the permit system. It's also the reason we have the permit system for a disability permit. Um, and I am a little concerned that the officers have made notice that yours has actually expired. So I'd be really grateful if you could just confirm and check that because I would hate for you to get a parking if you were parked leg legitimately in a disabled spot and your permit had ex expired. And I know that they are free as far as my understanding is through the state government. So I would um, suggest you potentially look at that. Um, and look, I can appreciate that my response is probably not the answer you were hoping for, but we do have a responsibility as a council to enforce all the laws for it responsible in a transparent and considered manner. Um, I would say, as we're talking about the disability parking, I'd suspect you'd be very up to see a disabled um, parking space taken up by an able-bodied person. And as a local councillor, and I'm sure all of my colleagues from both sides of the chamber would agree, um, that's something that we get spoken to on a regular basis, that, you know, people are trying to park in the disabled spots and able bodies are parking in them. So um, the reason is, the, so the same principle applies to cities loading zones, which is so important for our business um, across the city. So again, I can only suggest that you um, um, make the appropriate application for a valid permit so you can continue to do your good work in delivering flowers across the city and suburbs to those who would like to have them. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that you're doing the right thing as far as being COVID safe and practicing safe um, practices with COVID. It's certainly very important, which is again, why we're not in chambers today. So um, I would just want to say that um, I understand that you do have a third appeal avenue, which is through the courts. Um, and if you still feel strongly enough about this matter, I would encourage you to explore that option further. Thank you. Which is what yeah. I will do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, I have to take this because. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Absalom. All right. Thank you, councillors. Uh, I will now draw the council's attention to the item question time. Point of order, Chair. Point of order. Got two points of order. No, just one. Okay. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. I'd just uh, like to move suspension of standing orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion, which I will. Uh, email through momentarily that Brisbane City Council immediately ban electric fences adjoining council parks. Seconded. And that has been sent. Okay, I've got an urgency motion uh, moved by Councillor Cassidy. I think seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Yes. Uh, all right, uh, Count that's been distributed now. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, three minutes to urgency, please. Thanks very much, Chair. And it's become urgent because um, we've only just found out in the last couple of days that um, children are literally being electrocuted in our suburban parks. And I don't think anyone in this chamber or anyone around Brisbane would find that to be acceptable. Now, here in the city of Brisbane, we have a set of rules which evidently, according to Councillor Owen and the LNP, um, allow the use of electric fences adjoining council parks. If you go a little bit further south of Councillor Owen's ward in the city of Logan, this would not stand. This type of electric fence that we've seen uh, recently electrocuting children in parks would not be allowed. Uh, but after some in-depth investigation by Councillor Owen Chair, um, she's determined that it's perfectly okay to have yeah, these yeah, electric Councilor fences Cassidy, operating Councilor in Cassidy, suburban parks. Back to urgency for me, please. It's, uh, well, I think it should go without saying, Chair, why this is urgent. We Appreciate cannot have a situation uh, in which under Council's current rules, it is perfectly okay um, for children to be electrocuted in our parks. I mean, that just simply should not stand. It's urgent because parents shouldn't be worried about their children going into a council park and being electrocuted. Um, and it's, it's no good for this administration to say that there's a small rickety uh, chicken wire fence or something uh, protecting, uh, protecting people, whether it's in the park in question or, or in any park around Brisbane. I don't think it's acceptable. Um, Chair, so I think this is the sort of matter that uh, this council should be dealing with at the moment. It's, it's particularly urgent because we know there is a live case. There's a live case in a suburban park right now. Um, but if we leave this open, if we leave this open 
uh, now and we don't enforce better rules like they do in Logan uh, and protect the community, we could see more children being electrocuted on this administration's watch chair. I'll now put the item in a matter of urgency. All those who believe this to be urgent, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The noes have it. Division. Division. Well, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook, please ring the bells. Uh, councillors, all those in favour of the urgency, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. 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 Please lower your hands and those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. No. You guys want to make sure no one else gets hurt. They've been warned they'll be sued now. Please lower your hands. Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Now begins question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any standing committees? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, the federal government recently approached council inviting us to nominate projects for the local roads and community infrastructure grant program. Can you outline for the chamber which projects council has put forward for consideration and what this funding will mean to the residents of Brisbane? The Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hutton, through you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, we know that right now, um, fast tracking projects, uh, whether it's in partnership with uh, the federal government or the state government, or whether it's council fast tracking it, its own projects is really, really important given the current economic circumstances, the need to support local business and jobs. Uh, and I can say that uh, for council's part, uh, we are investing uh, and we are budgeted in the current financial year to invest $800 million into capital works, $800 million into building things, into maintaining things, uh, which is a big injection into the local economy. And also as part of that program, we have our target of 80% uh, of contracts going to local businesses. Uh, and so that $800 million injection into capital works is also an injection into local businesses and supporting local jobs. But as I said, we're keen to work with other levels of government to support them in their projects. There's money available uh, from uh, the federal government and the state government, and we're happy to put that money to good use, bringing forward important local improvements. Uh, and I can say that when it comes to the uh, federal government's local roads and community infrastructure program, uh, we have submitted a list of uh, 24 priority projects, totaling $11.7 million uh, in funding. Uh, and we are, uh, waiting with anticipation for a response from the federal government on those projects. And we understand that that response will be coming very soon. Uh, the aim with these projects is to make sure we distribute the funding uh, right across the city on projects that need to happen, uh, projects that we can bring forward uh, with, um, that, are, that are ready to go. Uh, and so in our 24 projects, uh, we have uh, submitted through uh, sports field lighting improvements and works at 60 different locations across Brisbane. Uh, so spread right across the city and suburbs. Uh, infrastructure upgrades to the city botanic gardens, including uh, water, water efficiency improvements. Maintenance upgrades to several council and community facilities, uh, including uh, the Women's Community Aid Association at East Brisbane. Uh, the Golden Years Senior Centre at Nunda. Africa House at Morningside. Uh, the Cannon Hill Community Sports Club in Cannon Hill and the Warra Re Rehoming Centre at Bracken Ridge. Uh, we've also uh, requested funding to uh, do more, more work with our Flood Resilience Home Program, which is about working with residents to help them uh, retrofit their properties uh, 
to be more flood resilient using flood resilient materials, design techniques, which ultimately is about reducing flood impacts on uh, the residents of Brisbane. We've also nominated a number of council conservation reserves, including Turi Forest, uh, Titchi Tamba uh, Wetlands and Mil Milne Hill Reserve in Chermside West uh, for improvements. Uh, that includes improvements to walking tracks, uh, to improve the safety, amenity and accessibility for local residents in these fantastic conservation reserves. These uh, projects and others uh, include uh, 24 projects totaling 11.7 million that we have requested. And I look forward to uh, updating uh, the, the council chamber and councillors uh, when we receive a response from the federal government uh, in the near future on those matters. Uh, we've also heard recently about state government funding that has been provided uh, to Brisbane City Council and we've uh, discussed some of the projects that have been put forward uh, in those initiatives. We continue to work with other levels of government uh, to respond to the impacts of COVID to support local jobs uh, and these projects and these federal and state programs are a great uh, I guess complement uh, and a great uh, I guess um, addition to the work that we're doing as part of our 800 million dollar investment in capital works in the current financial year uh, Mr. Chair. So thank you for the question through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Sutton. Uh, and I look forward to uh, letting you know about the results of that application as soon as they're available. Further so question, um, Councillor Strunk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Lord Mayor, I have an elderly couple in my ward who were relying upon the curbside collection to get rid of some large bulky items. They have missed out on this service for the last financial year and will also miss out on another two. When you cancel curbside collection... So Councillor, uh, Councillor Strunk, can I just stop you there? With, with these, these questions have to be addressed to, to me, like to the Lord Mayor through me. So you have to say, I have a question for the Lord Mayor and then you can't you have to say, can the Lord Mayor rather than you? Please, please proceed. Would you like me to start again? No, no, just, just, just for the future. Thank you, Chair, for your uh, guidance. Uh, when you canceled uh, the curbside collection, the couple applied for the Good Neighbor Cleanup Scheme, but was knocked back because they had extended family. Uh, it turned out that the extended family couldn't help them. They were both uh, well over the age of 60, and one of them has a chronic back condition. The local Anala Lions Club was forced to pick up the uh, pieces uh, after the council failed and they also paid uh, for that uh, for the uh, removal of the items to the dump. Lord Mayor, will you apologize to the people you have let down by canceling curbside collection and reinstate this critical service immediately? Thank you. The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, the, um, the first apology I do want to make is for calling Councillor Hutton and Councillor Sutton. Um, that is uh, something I do want to apologise for. Um, I know that uh, Councillor uh, Sutton was highly regarded by many in, in the chamber when she was. Come a on, just to answer the question. And, and I and I know that Councillor Hutton will be even more highly regarded as uh, she moves forward as an active local councillor. Uh, but Councillor Strunk, anyone would expect from your question that we weren't in the middle of the greatest economic challenge that our city and our country has seen in generations. Anyone would think uh, that there is no belt tightening or no impacts of this on the council. Not on budget. your marketing, there's not. And anyone would think uh, that uh, this is a service which people rely on on a daily or weekly basis. That is not the case. This is a once a year service that council uh, likes to provide when we have the funding available and which many other councils do not provide at all. Many other councils do not provide this service. Uh, so this is a over and above well, their fault, is it? service that uh, council has provided because we have responsibly managed the council's budget over many years. And in responsibly managing the budget this year, it is something we have had to temporarily pause. Now, I understand that there are many residents who are looking forward to this service resuming. Uh, and I understand that there are some residents that may be upset by that. But unfortunately, this is a case of making sure that our budget can stay strong so that we can continue to provide all of those daily and weekly ongoing essential services that people re rely on. We can keep 
maintaining the footpaths and investing record amounts into our roads and footpaths. We Not can doing keep that either. the grass in the park. We can keep uh, doing all those uh, essential day-to-day -day services that people rely on, providing the libraries and the city cats, uh, providing the bus services, collecting the rubbish in their red top and yellow top and green top bins. What are all These the rubbish are on the essential street? services. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Please let out the answer we heard in silence, the Lord Mayor. These are the essential services which we are absolutely focused on making sure we deliver for the people of Brisbane. But I have been very clear that as soon as we can afford to bring back the curbside collection, uh, we will bring it back. And so I apologise yeah, so for the no, inconvenience no that Lord is Mayor. temporarily caused by COVID. I apologise for the fact that there has been a $180 million hit to our budget which we've had to find savings to meet. I apologise for that, but I do not apologise for responsible financial management. And I also do not apologise for making sure that there are uh, schemes in place to support people who qualify through the Good Neighbour Cleanup Scheme. Now, there are uh, many organisations that are more than willing and happy to assist. And I would suggest that the suggestion that the Lions Club was forced to clean up uh, was is not really an appropriate one because I know Lions Clubs that I've dealt with are more than happy to roll up their sleeves and help their neighbours and help their community. This is not something they begrudge. This is not something they do under duress. This is something they do because they want to help the community. And I'm sure your Lions Club really wanted to help. And I think it's fantastic that they did. Uh, there are uh, clear guidelines in place for the Good Neighbour Cleanup Scheme and, and that has to exist for a reason. Uh, but ultimately, we are facing unprecedented economic challenges in this city. And that means unprecedented financial challenges in council, ones that we are rising to meet head on. But uh, as I've said, our priority is to make sure we maintain those day-to-day, week-to-week essential services that people rely on. And when we can, when we can afford to, we will bring back the curbside collection. I have made that commitment before and I will make it again. I wanna see the curbside collection back just as much as anyone. And it will come back, but it will come back when we can afford to do so. And so, uh, Mr. Strunk, uh, Councillor Strunk, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, my message to your residents is I apologise for the inconvenience. I apologise for the situation they are in, uh, and I understand, um, but I am also thankful for the great work that clubs like Lions do, and the many charities that organise these pickups as well uh, across the city do, because they are really helping in a time of crisis uh, and our community organisations do a fantastic job in that respect. Uh, meanwhile, Council will continue to provide the Good Neighbour Cleanup Service uh, for people that meet those eligibility criteria, because I think it's an important way of helping those who are most vulnerable in the community. Uh, and while we can't afford to do a widespread collection at this point in time, we certainly can do it in that targeted way through the Good Neighbour Cleanup Scheme. Thank you, Mr Chair. Point of order, Mr Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move uh, the suspension of standing orders to uh, enable me to move the following motion. That the Lord Mayor immediately reinstates curbside collection. Seconded. All right. I have an urgency motion from Councillor Strunk, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Councillor Strunk, you've got three minutes. Please focus your uh, comments on the matter of urgency. Councillor Strunk. Yes, well, I have sent that through to you, Chair. Thank you. It will be distributed. Chair, this matter is urgent because the city has become a dumping ground. The same month that the Lord Mayor scrapped curbside collection, illegal dumping reports skyrocketed from the average of two per month to 30 per month. Chair, this is also urgent because the so-called good neighbor cleanup scheme is failing residents. Elderly residents are being told to uh, hire a ute or a trailer and do it themselves. It is one, in one case, the Anala Lions Club felt so bad for a local elderly couple being rejected by the council's good neighbor clean, cleanup scheme that they took the rubbish to the tip and paid for that to be done. In this case, both the residents were over the age of 60 and had chronic, and one of them had chronic back injury. It is urgent because the treatment of residents like this is unacceptable and can no longer be sustained. Most of these elderly residents are being rejected. 
can't even physically take the items to the dump or let alone to the gutter to have them cleaned up or put into a ute or trailer. This matter is urgent because curbside collection is a vital community service that all Brisbane residents rely upon. In one week, an online petition calling for the Lord Mayor to reinstate the service gained 5,434 signatures. There's also been multiple other petitions circulating, gaining thousands of more signatures, proving that this popular dependable, uh, that, the, that this popular and dependable curbside collection is undertaken. Instead of wasting money on advertising himself and cost blowouts on major projects, how about the Lord Mayor focus on delivering the basic necessity of service of the city? This Lord Mayor needs to reinstate curbside collection as a matter of urgency, I so move. On the matter of urgency, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The noes have it. Division. Division for what? Councillor Cassidy. Division. Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Have a run. Oh. All right. All those in favour on the topic of urgency, on the matter of urgency, all those in favour say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Please lower your hands. Those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. No. Same. Thank you. Clarks, when you're ready, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour, 20 against and one abstention. The noes have it. Question time will now... will now proceed. Are there any further questions? Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, this past week we heard of the class action being lodged with the Queensland Supreme Court regarding poll administration fees. On a related note, can you please remind the Chamber of the position of the consecutive LNP administrations in this place of our calls to implement a Queensland tolling ombudsman? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you to Councillor Atwood for the question. Yes, some uh, interesting stories in the media during the week about tolling disputes. Um, toll roads are important assets for our city. They help to reduce congestion on the untolled road network in the suburbs and in a city, and in turn, uh, help to make Brisbane roads safer. Toll roads can play an important role in providing the means for quicker and safer transport in into out of and through the city and less congestion from idling cars means cleaner air. Each day, thousands of Brisbane residents choose to use toll roads for a more convenient commute to work and to get home faster too at day's end. Uh, tradespeople and couriers uh, know that there is value too in their businesses when they're using the toll roads. But um, in regards to disputes about charges that may arise, it is council's position that those who use toll roads should have the right to question and dispute tolling charges through a fair and transparent process. This administration does not believe that the current tolling ombudsman arrangements uh, are, are the best outcome for Brisbane residents. For quite some time, the tolling customer ombudsman based interstate has been reviewing disputes for Brisbane tollways as well as tollways in other Australian states. With this ombudsman position being funded by the tollway operators, there is reasonable concern with, within the community that this process is not impartial, a concern this administration shares and has vocalised for some several years. Um, Mr Chair, this concern 
triggered a Queensland parliamentary inquiry into tolling operations, the findings of which were published in September 2018. The Transport and Public Works Committee articulated a strong uh, recommendation from this inquiry, which was that the Minister for Transport and Main Roads consider the establishment of a Queensland-based toll road ombudsman. Two years later, nothing has changed and the tolling customer ombudsman based interstate continues to review Queensland toll disputes. Mr Chair, as early as 2016, even before the parliamentary inquiry, this administration has been calling on the state government to establish a dedicated, independent Queensland tolling ombudsman to handle tolling complaints in Brisbane and Queensland. My predecessor uh, as infrastructure chair, former councillor, and uh, Amanda Cooper, and future state member for ASPLE, um, wrote to Minister Bailey in September 2016, and again in February 2017, calling for the state government to establish an independent Queensland ombudsman for toll road issues and disputes. In Minister Bailey's first response in December 2016, he incorrectly advised that the Queensland ombudsman who investigates complaints about a wide range of government matters had the authority to also review tolling complaints. He corrected himself in his second response in June 2017, however, still gave no commitment or even acknowledgement that the, uh, there was a need to establish an independent tolling ombudsman. We then witnessed a backflip by the state government, as we often do, with a media release from the minister in December 2018 and subsequent media articles from the Labor government uh, and support, supporting, they said, a new Queensland tolling ombudsman. According to the media release, the state government supported all five of the Transport and Public Work Committee recommendations, including that recommendation to consider establishing a Queensland-based toll road ombudsman uh, and was already working, they said, to implement them. Uh, the minister also claimed in the release that he had, uh, quote, written to the council requesting its views on the committee's recommendations, close quote, despite, Mr Chair, council calling for this action and asking for state government cooperation two years earlier. Most recently in January of this year, council has again reiterated the need for an independent Queensland-based tolling on ombudsman. Unfortunately, we still haven't seen any action from the state government and there's no indication from the minister that he intends to establish that independent tolling ombudsman that the Brisbane and wider community wants and deserves. I'd like to acknowledge that there have been positive steps by Transurban Queensland over the last few years to improve the customer experience of tollways. And I do acknowledge that there's been a reduction in the volume of complaints about tolls. But that being said, Brisbane residents deserve the right to engage an independent, fair and transparent disputes process with an independent Queensland-based tolling ombudsman. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions? Councillor yep. Tree. Thanks, Chair. My question's to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, over the past 10 years, an estimated 10,000 people... Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, I didn't get a question last week, Mr Chairman, and I think it's my turn this week for a question. I am sure you got a question last week. And it's Councillor Shree's turn. Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, as I was saying to the Lord Mayor, over the past 10 years, an estimated 10,000 residents have moved into the Gabba Ward. And during that time, there's been no creation of any new parkland of any significant size. Despite the economic impacts of COVID, over the next five years, a further 10,000 residents are predicted to move into the Gabba Ward. Now, City Plan's desired standards of service identifies that for every 1,000 residents in a local area, there should be at least 1.4 hectares of public parkland within that local area. So my question is, having regard to the massive increase in the population of the government over the recent years and the projected increase over the coming five years, how many hectares of new public parkland does your administration anticipate creating within the current boundaries of the Gabba Ward over the coming five year period? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Councillor Tree. Look, 
I, we've had a chat about this particular type of question before, and um, th this idea that people judge the provision of parkland by one simple mechanism, which is a square meter or a, a per hectare uh, measurement is simply not the reality of how people look at parkland. And uh, we know that yes, there's desired levels of service uh, in the city plan. Um, that's from a town planning perspective. But having said that, the way that the average person has a look at the provision of parkland is, is certainly not by a square meter or hectare uh, perspective. In fact, they would have um, very little knowledge of how many hectares of parkland there were within a certain distance of their house, but they know that there are local parks available. And I think the real question is uh, not exactly the square meterage or hectare provision, but whether those parks are usable, accessible, uh, whether they're being invested in by council uh, and whether there are new parks being created. Now, uh, Councillor Shree, you suggested that there'd been no new parks created uh, in... Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Claim to be misrepresented. I said no new parks of significant size. Uh, well, all right, I'll note your misrepresentation. We'll return to you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, significant size, well, that, that's a very, um, I guess, subjective uh, measure because uh, on a regular basis, I go past this fantastic new park that's been created at Carl Street Veranda. Is that in your ward, Councillor Shree? No? Uh, no. Yeah. no? Uh, Lord Mayor, um, can I request all comments be made through the chair, please? I also um, uh, was honoured to be together with Councillor Fiona Cunningham recently for the opening of some great improvements that have been made to Davies Park, uh, to the West End Urban Common, um, and also improvements of usability of places like Riverside, Riverside Drive in West End. Uh, but the reality is we are not only creating new parks, but we are also upgrading uh, public land and green space and parkland to make it more usable. And that often is just as important um, as the provision of some kind of square metre uh, measurement of parkland. Whether that parkland is being invested in is usable, whether that parkland is accessible uh, to people, uh, and uh, we're definitely investing in that. Uh, I'm very proud to have established uh, the Green Future Fund, which is all about expanding the provision of parkland and also making existing parkland more usable. Uh, and this year, uh, we're seeing yet another investment into that uh, from the dividends of the City of Brisbane Investment Corporation. We also see significant ongoing investment uh, in the creation of new parks through our priority infrastructure plan or the local government infrastructure plans, which identify new parkland. And that is created in combination uh, through uh, the provision of, or the purchase of land um, from the private sector, and also um, the creation of parkland through the development process as well. So there's a whole range of mechanisms where new parkland is being created. And I think that one of the reasons so many people are attracted uh, to live in the Gabba Ward is not because they have a great local councillor, it is because it is such a well-serviced and conveniently located ward that has access to fantastic parkland and community facilities and infrastructure. Uh, and um, to suggest otherwise would be, um, I guess, making an inappropriate comparison with other parts of the city. Uh, the, the Gabba Ward has an incredible level of infrastructure and parkland provision. Um, and uh, that is something that we are proud of investing in. And so uh, this idea that somehow the, the, Gabba is, the Gabba Wood is under service, I do not accept that. I think that one of the reasons so many people have been moving to the Gabba Ward is the, the sheer attraction of the ward as a livable place, as a place that is easily accessible, as a place that has great infrastructure, as a place that has great parks, uh, and uh, as a place that's so well uh, located to the city and other inner city locations. And so, um, I certainly do not share this view that somehow the Gabba Ward is underserviced. Uh, do you, um, are you entitled to have a wish list for more as a local councillor? Absolutely. Every single councillor in this meeting has a wish list for more, um, and that is their job. That is their job to be advocates for the community. Uh, but I think there will be many councillors in this place that would be envious of the level of uh, provision of parkland and infrastructure and facilities that exist in the Gabba Ward. Uh, and so uh, we will continue to invest in 
those facilities, uh, not only in the Gabba Ward, but also uh, ward widely across the city in different wards, uh, you know, whether it's from uh, Callum Vale to Bracken Ridge. Lord to Mayor, Port your time Vale, has expired. Uh, to Doughboy Ward. Lord, Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Uh, Councillor Shree, you had a misrepresentation. Thanks, Chair. Just the Mayor appeared to suggest that I was claiming that there'd been no new parks created in the Gabba Ward. I am aware of Banyapa Park, which is about 400 square metres of actual green space. That's the only park I'm aware of that's been created within the boundaries yeah, of the Thank Gabbard. you, Councillor Shree. Uh, also, to the earlier point of order, uh, my records show that Councillor Johnson had the fourth question last week, and it was regarding a lookout in Corinda. Further questions? Councillor Mackay. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, last week you outlined for the Chamber the Council's position on the public housing development at 33 Glen Road in Tawong. Can you please outline to the Chamber the importance of consultation when it comes to matters of city planning? Councillor, uh, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Mackay, for the question. I am sure you are a very relieved councillor of the beautiful area of Tawong. A lot can happen in 48 hours. And yesterday we found out that Mr. Mick Jabrini, Minister for Housing and Public Works confirmed that the state would not be extending the lease over 33 Glen Road in Tawong. And can I say congratulations to you and your residents for making it very, very clear um, what their expectations were for housing in their local area. The lease expired on the 18th, uh, expires on the 18th of January 2021, and we're very happy to see that that option is not going to be exercised because I spoke about last week the unfortunate social consequences that came as a result of that out of the blue policy decision were terribly upsetting to the local residents. Poor social behaviour did lead to some significant criminal activity. And it was just something that no one in Glen Road ever expected to happen in residences in their streets. But the inability even for the state government to take responsibility of the decision leads us to what we see now and they've thrown in the towel or hopefully listened uh, to the local councillor and the residents and have decided that the significant social impacts, um, some that have never been seen in this area before, that were something that were not suitable for this area as well. I know that Councillor Mackay was building daily briefs from residents, giving him real-time updates on what was happening. And it did seem at one stage, I'm sure Councillor Mackay, through you, Mr Chair, to be a never-ending saga. But these are the type of impacts we see to social fabric when we do not actually consult with the local residents. On a more technical note from city planning perspective, the, the public housing proposal didn't stack up and it wasn't in keeping what other uh, expectations of what the residential area was there in city plan or any planning scheme in this area. From car parking to the private open space, the infrastructure charge reductions, um, that they got from being a student accommodation when what we saw was a conversion um, to public, house mayor, uh, public housing uh, was in a compliance issue on several levels. And these issues are far too big to be considered as performance outcomes. It was dealt with in a totally unorthodox and unreasonable manner. One which council hasn't seen before where we just flip uh, the student accommodation straight into public housing. And we hope that this experiment will not be seen again. Um, Council is aware of temporary use licences that the state introduced as a special COVID measure, a special tool designed to give businesses a quick fix when it came to pivoting during the pandemic. On the face of it, that is an absolutely valid use for a temporary use licence. However, Glen Road in Tawong was not subject to a temporary use license. What happened was a complete overriding of our approval we granted for student accommodation for all intents and purposes. Um, they called it in and changed it after the use had already started. And no one expects this type of outcome in their neighbourhood that uh, planning decisions are turned on its head overnight and absolutely no support from the people that made the decision, decision either in the first place. Uh, as we mentioned, the change went from student accommodation to public housing, which in a city planning terms means it went from rooming accommodation to multi-dwelling units. And that's a very, very different planning outcome in the city plan scheme. A significant 
intensification of use without the appropriate amenities. And that is why council has always sought to consult far and wide on matters to do with city planning. We understand how interested residents can be when building construction comes to their neighbourhood and especially uh, when it's something that maybe they weren't expecting. Uh, take Plan Your Brisbane, for example, the city's largest engagement exercise ever in 2017. Over 100,000 residents had their say. 15,000 unique ideas created and every suburb in Brisbane took part in that, uh, that exercise. It was extremely successful and it has gone on to see many changes and components of our city plans through amendments since that time as well. For example, townhouses in low density residential uh, are now not uh, compliant in our city plan. Car parking ratios have increased. Um, the alert system for the new buildings, which we'll talk about in committee today, goes live next week. And we have boosted the funding for village precincts projects because we heard loud and clearly that people want to be engaged in their suburbs and uh, see their suburbs being enlivened so it can all happen just at the end of their streets. That is what residents ask of us and that what they got, that's what they got. So when it comes to city planning, we need to leave it to the level of government with the tools to do it properly. What we see in, is in PDAs and Glen Road is overdevelopment. Um, the state government's records are not strong in this place and all. And with all said, Councillor we are Adams, very happy now that the security expired. knowing this lease will not be yep. renewed. Councillor Adams, your time yep. has expired. Further questions, Councillor Cassidy? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question uh, is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, in a single year, you wasted $6.5 million on two feel-good advertising campaigns and glossy self-promotion and, and even more on political polling. That's an advertising budget that most large companies would be positively green with envy over. Coincidentally, that's the exact same amount it costs to fund curbside collection for a year. Lord Mayor, you cancel curbside collection to save money, but you're still out there putting your face on every Living in Brisbane newsletter. Why do you prioritise marketing yourself over a vital community service like curbside collection? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, through you, Mr. Chair, um, this is a yet another of a long list of claims uh, that you and your colleagues continue to make that is simply not the case. It is simply not the case. Now, uh, th this figure that you claim to be the case of uh, self-promotional material uh, I don't know where you got that from, but it's a figure that keeps changing because it's a you figure that to us. in the election... Uh, no, no, I didn't give you that figure. Lord, I didn't give you that. Lord Mayor, can the I please... On no, 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 no one speak while I'm speaking, please. Can I insist that all comments be made uh, to and through the chair, please? Lord Mayor. Uh, but uh, you, if you're suggesting that um, council communications with residents is somehow self-promotion... Uh, then you are when you stick your photo on it, yeah, entirely. No, 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 there will be no bickering. The, the question was heard in silence, the answer will be heard in silence. Comments will be addressed to the chair, Lord Mayor. The promotion that uh, I engage in and this council engages in uh, is the promotion of council projects and the encouragement of people to have their say on those projects. Uh, the in engagement process that is so important into delivering a good outcome. I promote local jobs. I promote local businesses. I, I promote local charities and community groups. Uh, and these are the things that I'm focused on promoting. And I'm focused on making sure that council uh, engages with residents actively. Now, uh, I uh, am not aware of a case uh, where any of those council publications that you were talking about have, for example, seven photographs of myself on them, Councillor Cassidy, like your latest newsletter does. I think that the only one engaging in self-promotion, Mr Chair, is Councillor Cassidy. And if you look at his latest newsletter, uh, there are no fewer than seven photographs of himself on them. And I ask you, is this Dang. Mr Chair, a ratepayer funded publication? Hot kettle is this a ratepayer funded publication? Yes, it is. Mr Chair, the only person who is better at self-promotion than Councillor Cassidy, I think, is Councillor Cook, who I think has 11 photos on one of her newsletters. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, 
Councillor Cassidy, I can see the smile on your face and I, I know why you're smiling. Uh, this is uh, a purely political claim you're making. Uh, it is simply not factual and it is one of many uh, politically motivated claims that you make uh, that I think uh, mislead the people of Brisbane about the true facts. Uh, and, and if you have a look at some of the examples, uh, we've heard today and repeated in recent weeks that apparently Brisbane is swimming in garbage or swimming in rubbish. Hands up anyone who has seen Brisbane swimming in garbage. Oh, your, your ward must be different to the rest of them, Councillor Cassidy, uh, because I haven't seen Brisbane swimming in garbage. But you're hiding and in I City Hall. Why don't you get out there? No, no, no. Right. I'm going to say it again. No bickering. The answer we heard in silence, uh, all comments will be addressed to and through the chair. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank He's you. too scared to come to my ward these days. No, no. Please allow the answer to be heard in silence for Lord Mayor. Uh, that's, that's great, um, uh, Mr Chair, because I was in Councillor Cassidy's ward uh, just on the weekend. Um, and it is looking very spick and span and the maintenance is done to a high level out there. And in fact, this was one of the things that Councillor Cassidy was claiming credit for in his recent newsletter, Mr Chair. Oh. He, in fact, uh, was trumpeting that he had $11 million worth of projects happening in his ward. And uh, is he responsible for those? Apparently, if you believe his newsletter, never mind that it's the Lord Mayor's budget, uh, never mind that uh, I made the decision on the allocation of those funds, but Councillor Cassidy is apparently 100% responsible for all the great things happening in his local area. And it illustrates the point, Mr Chair, because he comes in here and he talks about a, a city swimming in rubbish, yet in his local area, he's like, isn't it fantastic? All these great maintenance is happening. All these great projects are happening. Brisbane is better than ever. And Councillor Cassidy is apparently responsible for that. Uh, but people know the truth. People know the truth, Mr Chair. Councillor Cassidy is playing politics. He's making hyperbolic claims uh, that simply aren't true. Uh, he is making statements that are purely political and don't re reflect the reality of it. I mean, uh, we heard Councillor Strunk just saying before that people uh, were being locked out of the Good Neighbour cleanup scheme. And he, you know, according to what Councillor Strunk said, you would think that everyone's being turned away. Well, I'm aware that we have received 647 requests to be involved in the Good Neighbour cleanup scheme by people who. Uh, want that want to be part of that scheme or benefit from that scheme and only nine requests were deemed ineligible 647 requests in total and only nine people were told that they were ineligible yet according to what labor is peddling in this meeting you would think everyone is being turned away not the truth it's it's pure hyperbole uh, lord mayor your time has expired further questions councillor landers Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Community, Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, starting in September, Brisbane Festival will kick off with a different twist this year due to COVID-19. Can you outline what exciting events will still be available to residents and visitors at Brisbane Festival 2020? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, Mr. Chair, thanks to Councillor Landers for the question. So, um, Mr. Chair, at a time when many cities across the globe have cancelled swathes of festivals and events, when so many artists and creatives are struggling to make ends meet with most cultural events being cancelled, Brisbane refuses to let this pandemic get the best of us. Brisbane Festival has been turning the city pink every September for over 20 years. And while it may look a little different this year, nothing will stop us from continuing to celebrate our city and turn on those pink lights once again for the 21st year in a row. Brisbane Festival will once again continue this September and in doing so, we'll support more than 700 local artists. The fact that Brisbane Festival forges ahead is a testament to the spirit of Brisbane. We truly do live in a new world city. Offering a larger program than previous years, the 2020 festival will kick off next week on the 4th of September, providing a range of COVID safe events over four very exciting weeks. And this year, Brisbane Festival is all about reawakening Brisbane and appreciating
representing every beautiful part of what 500 performances across 91 events, 73 of which are free. across 250 locations, this year Brisbane 190 suburbs. It's all about celebrating our bold... Councillor Howard, can you hear me? and beautiful... Councillor Howard, can you hear yes, me? Yes, I can. Your, your uh, feed is yes. a little bit buggy um, and we're just double checking that. I've stopped oh. the clock on, the, on question time, so that's not an issue um, for, both, for both question time generally and sure. for your for your presentation. I just want to make sure that this works. Okay. We think that it's working now. Could please proceed? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, it is all about celebrating our bold and beautiful city, reawakening Brisbane and supporting our homegrown creatives. This year, Brisbane Festival will employ more local artists than ever before. And as the stars of the shows, they will fill the city with art, take art to the people, provide a personal and human connection, make a lifelong impression, invite audiences back into beloved venues and create a citywide cleansing led by our first people. Welcoming audiences to the grand opening of the iconic Metro Arts at their new home in West End and filling the city with music and to be, as we say, proudly, boldly Brisbane. 28 new works commissioned especially for the Brisbane Festival. And of course, this year's program has evolved to ensure that we can all enjoy the celebrations safely. The safety of the performers, audience members and festival staff is and always will be of paramount importance. This year's program is being designed in a way that people can enjoy together without gathering together. Brisbane Festival will ensure all social distancing restrictions are adhered to as part of the organisation's Queensland Health approved COVID safe event plan. There really are just so many exciting things on offer this year. And I want to congratulate Brisbane Festival's new artistic director, Louise Bazina, who has gone above and beyond in delivering such an amazing offer of activities and events for us to enjoy. In her own words, Brisbane Festival is just the tonic our state needs. It is a chance for us to welcome joy and celebration back to the suburbs and streets and reacquaint ourselves with the city, its people, artists and lifestyle. So can I say once again, congratulations, Louise, and thank you to you and all of the Brisbane Festival team for the incredible work that you have done. It's great to see so many residents excited about the festival and with some events already booked out. So I encourage everyone to get online now and book a ticket to your favourite event to make sure that you don't miss out. So one of my favourite events is going to be the, sweet, the, the Street Serenades. And that's the biggest music extravaganza in Brisbane's history with Brisbane Festival serenading the suburbs of our glorious city. Over the four weeks of the festival, pop-up concerts will be delivered direct to Brisbane's neighbourhoods. Inspired partially by the musical performances in Rome, which took place on balconies during COVID-19 pandemic, Street Serenades is one of the program highlights. Concerts in cul-de-sacs, symphonies for your suburb and performances in parks will arrive on bespoke stages on wheels, bringing music to the streets and reaching all 190 suburbs in Brisbane. The epic music program will feature some of Brisbane's best contemporary musicians, DJs. Howard, your time has expired. Thank Other you. Further questions, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, you've been doing and saying anything today to avoid giving a straight answer on curbside collection. But I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and ask you another one. Uh, to see if you feel like giving a proper answer to the people of Brisbane. It's a very, very simple question. You spent $6.5 million in one year on feel-good advertising campaigns for your administration and you cancelled curbside collection to save $6.5 million. You clearly think it's more important to spend $6.5 million on advertising yourself than on important services like curbside collection. Why is your priority you not the people of Brisbane, Lord Mayor. The Lord Mayor. Mr Chair, there he goes again, trying to mislead the people of Brisbane with false information. 
Uh, it's interesting because um, I can only assume that he's referring to um, the Briz Better campaign maybe last year. Uh, that was last year. That was pre-COVID. That was a completely different financial year. And that was a campaign which was fantastically well received and appreciated by the people of Brisbane because it let people uh, have a clear insight into some of the great things council is doing on their behalf uh, in investing their money in making Brisbane a better place. Uh, and uh, for Councillor Cassidy to somehow suggest that uh, you can cancel a campaign that has already happened and happened last year um, in a different financial year as some kind of magic funding pudding uh, shows a complete lack of understanding that we're in a different financial year, we're in a different economic climate, uh, and uh, this is, you know, I mean, it might be easy to put up a Facebook post, Mr. Chair, suggesting <coughs> that you could save 6.5 million of money that's already been spent on a great campaign supporting Brisbane and Brisbane projects Billion. to somehow fund uh, something that's happening this financial year. That It doesn't actually work like that, Councillor Cassidy, you know that. Uh, and so uh, what we will continue to do is invest $800 million into capital works uh, and improvements this year that will help create jobs and support the people of Brisbane. $800 million of investment and injection into our city and suburbs. Uh, as I was saying, right from uh, Callumvale to Brackenridge, uh, from Deegan to Pullenvale, uh, from Doughboy, uh, right across to Jamboree with Councillor Hutton, not Councillor Sutton, and uh, all across the suburbs of Brisbane, we will invest in making this city a better place and we will do so in a financially responsible way. Uh, but the only expert in self-promotion that I'm aware of is Councillor Cassidy, Mr. Chair, and Councillor Cook. They're in a race for uh, the number of photos that they produce in their ratepayer funded newsletter, which they send out to their local residents. And I, I could only say that I, I'm not aware of any case where uh, as Lord Mayor, I've sent out material with as many photos as, as they have. But as I pointed out before, I'm interested in promoting uh, the great projects that council is doing. I'm interested in promoting local business and local jobs. I'm interested in promoting uh, local sporting community groups and providing support. Uh, whereas Councillor Cassidy is interested in party politics and playing games. But Councillor Cassidy is not all uh, interested in himself, I have to say, because um, his true allegiances are indicated clearly on the front cover of his latest newsletter. Now, it's a bit hard to see on, on Zoom. No, it's not working. But he is interested in promoting someone else because there's a photo that's even bigger than his on the front page, and that is Sterling Hinchcliffe's photo. Anyone would think that had a cynical mind that this was programmed to time exactly before the next state election so that he can promote his mate, Sterling Hinchcliffe, in the upcoming election campaign. So his motives are not all self-interested. They're partially altruistic. He is uh, a very loyal servant of the Labor Party you, and he will do anything possible. There's a, there's a point of order to Councillor Johnston. Point of order. I've called you. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear anything. Uh, the Lord Mayor is imputing motive. The Lord Mayor said in his own words he was deliberately imputing motive and that is contrary to the rules of procedure. I didn't see it that way. <laughs> he said he was, no, no, clearly. No, no, no. Um, uh, but I will once again insist that no councillor reflects um, adversely upon any other councillor or any officer, the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Oh, look, I was actually um, I was speaking very highly of Councillor Cassidy's loyalty to the party and to uh, his state colleague, uh, Sterling Hinchliffe. Uh, he is certainly loyal to the Labor Party and he is certainly loyal to his mate, uh, Sterling Hinchliffe. Um, to the people of Brisbane, maybe a different story, uh, but there is a high level of loyalty to the party there. Uh, and he made that clear with his latest newsletter where Minister Hinchliffe's photo is even bigger than his. Um, maybe there's not seven photos of Minister Hinchliffe, um, but there is a really big giant one on the front page uh, that will go out nicely before the next state election. So, uh, look, I, I wasn't uh, imputing anyone's motives. I was simply saying he's very loyal to the party, very loyal to the Labor Party and his state Labor colleagues. Uh, but uh, let's see this for what it is. Uh, another politically motivated question, uh, another uh, Labor attempt 
to deliberately provide information that could potentially mislead the people of Brisbane. Uh, the suggestion that there's some kind of magic pudding for funding by cancelling advertising or promotion that has already happened last year and somehow um, creating a magic pudding this year in a completely different budget year, in a completely different economic circumstance. Uh, as I said, it might uh, work for a glib a political Facebook post, but it is not the reality of uh, how the budget situation works. Councillor Cassidy surely must know that. Lord uh, Mayor, but... your time has expired, and that includes question time. Uh, councillors, I will now move to the reports. Uh, the Establishment and Coordination Committee, please, uh, the Lord Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 17th of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 17th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, the Lord Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I just wanted to touch a little bit further on um, uh, the quite obvious um, uh, push by Labor councillors um, uh, and the use of hyperbole um, and, you know, extreme kind of language, uh, which, is, which just bare knows uh, bears no reality uh, to the situation uh, in Brisbane at the moment. Uh, and you see the, the claims that I mentioned before that uh, Brisbane is swimming in rubbish, uh, just simply not true. Uh, we see the claims that uh, elderly residents are being turned away in their droves uh, from the Good Neighbour Cleanup Scheme. And we heard the statistics, uh, 647 applications and only nine were deemed ineligible uh, once again, Labor's claims proven to be not accurate. Uh, we've heard the claims last week about uh, footpaths, yet we've never invested more, or the city has never invested more in the footpaths, and the condition has never been better than it is now. Uh, is there more work to be done? Absolutely. It's an ongoing, so ongoing investment in the city, but no administration has ever invested more into footpaths than we are now. Uh, so the claims of underinvestment are simply politically motivated and not true. And then we heard um, the claim earlier in, in uh, question time uh, to suggest that somehow uh, children across the city were at risk of being electrocuted. Now, I have four young children uh, from the ages of two up to seven. And I can tell you, I am not afraid for my kids to play in a local park for fear of being electrocuted. Council has clear guidelines in place to make sure uh, that in cases where people do use electric fences, uh, that they are positioned appropriately away from the boundary of the property uh, and out of reach of someone that might reach through the fence. I'm now, there was one you. case. To grab a ball. One case. No interjections, please. Lord Mayor. There was one case that we were made aware of where an electric fence was located too close to the boundary. And we immediately acted to make sure that the owner met their obligations to fix up that situation. And I pay tribute uh, to the uh, local councillor and to Councillor Marks for making sure that that situation was addressed. But to somehow suggest that there's a citywide problem with kids being electrocuted in parks is more hyperbole. It's just a ridiculous claim to make. But this is what we hear time and time again again from the Labor Party, making ridiculously outrageous claims that simply aren't believable and don't have uh, the merit. But this is how Labor operates. Like, it, it, look, I mean, people can see through this, Mr Chair. They can see through these outrageous claims. We, they know that we continue to invest across the city in the basics. They know that we continue to manage the city's finances responsibly and keep the budget balanced and strong. They know that we continue to invest in both the minor and the major projects across the city. We continue to build uh, critical infrastructure, whether it's anything from Brisbane Metro uh, all the way through to local park upgrades. We're continuing to do those things that are important to the people of Brisbane. And we will continue that record going forward because we've got a team that cares about Brisbane. I care about Brisbane. A Brisbane is in my blood, uh, yet you have a opposition that cares about the Labor Party. They care about the state election uh, more than they care about the people of Brisbane. And I think that's really disappointing. But I did mention Metro before, and I wanted to provide a quick update on this critical project. Now, uh, just uh, to provide a short summary of where we are at and what has happened until now. 
uh, last last year, uh, council uh, saw that we had approved the contract for the construction of the fully electric uh, zero tailpipe uh, emission electric vehicles, uh, and the prototype is uh, has been uh, contracted and is now under construction. And certainly, I'm looking forward to seeing that prototype arrive in Brisbane uh, for testing. Uh, so that work continues. We've also geared up early works as well. Uh, and then there's been a number of early works started and, and particularly uh, intersection upgrades has been uh, around $5 million invested into intersection upgrades to prepare uh, the local area for the conversion of the Victoria Bridge to a green bridge as part of Brisbane Metro. Uh, and most recently we uh, received uh, state government approval or approval from Arts Queensland on the 3rd of April uh, to gear up the Peel Street, Gray Street and Stanley Place intersection upgrade. Uh, and that uh, work has been uh, progressing. Uh, we've, also, um, we've also had some great news about um, other approvals that we're waiting on as well that will help start um, the early works and the preparatory works for the project. Uh, and uh, there's been some positive uh, movement from the state government. Uh, just recently, uh, Councillor Murphy and I met again with Minister Bailey uh, to progress further discussions on Metro and make sure that uh, all the ducks were lining up when it comes to council and state cooperation and approvals that are required. And I do once again want to commend uh, Minister Bailey for uh, the work that he's been doing with his department in uh, working very cooperatively with us in recent times. Um, uh, you know, as we know, has been in, on the record. It hasn't always been the case, but it is now, and I appreciate it. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to uh, the finalisation of key approvals for Metro uh, to start the major construction works prior to the start of the government caretaker period. Now, we know that we are rapidly approaching a state election, and we know that uh, in the lead up to that state election, uh, there is a caretaker period which prevents the government from making any major decisions. And so we are very much working towards the finalisation of key approvals for Metro uh, in the lead up to that caretaker period. So that when caretaker period arrives, uh, we have those approvals in place and we can move forward to the next stages of Metro with confidence. Uh, what's at stake here? At the very least, 2,600 construction jobs uh, but also the whole range of benefits to the public transport network that will flow as a result of Brisbane Metro, uh, faster travel times, return up and go service, uh, investment in our local economy, uh, better public transport working in combination with Cross River Rail uh, so that we will see in uh, a few years time, both Cross River Rail and Brisbane Metro opening to provide incredible benefits across the public transport network. This is the vision that I have for the future, those two projects working together to provide better public transport, but also in the meantime, to create 2,600 jobs during construction, uh, and also uh, to provide incredible economic benefits to the city through that process. So uh, thank you to Minister Bailey for the cooperative approach he has been taking. I very much look forward to finalising some of those uh, approvals that are required uh, prior to the caretaker period starting. Uh, including um, the uh, permission to work on the busway, uh, which is an approval required under the Transport Infrastructure Act. Um, and that is a, an approval that we are very much uh, eagerly anticipating so that we can get the contractor on board, uh, the, the special consortia uh, of uh, Axiona and Arup that have been shortlisted to go ahead with this project, and we can gear up starting the creation of those 2,600 jobs. So. Uh, I'm sure all councillors will be excited uh, to hear the progress that is being made uh, on those approvals. Uh, and there are obviously there are many state approvals that are required, um, just like uh, with a Cross River Rail project, there's countless approvals that are required at the state level and also the council level. Uh, and as the project progresses, those approvals flow through. Um, and we're looking forward to the same thing happening for Brisbane Metro because ultimately, Brisbane Metro not only benefits the people of Brisbane um, and is a great Brisbane City Council project, but it has statewide benefits as well. When I say statewide, I mean, this is a project that benefits state infrastructure. And this is a project which facilitates uh, better public transport in Southeast Queensland. 
uh, where so many, uh, I guess, residents in the Queensland population uh, make their homes or find their work. Uh, and so this, this is a project of state significance uh, as well as council significance. And I look forward to uh, getting those approvals locked in prior to the caretaker period so that we can gear up those 2,600 jobs. Uh, Mr. Chair, today uh, marks uh, the Australian South Sea Islander Day of National Recognition. Uh, and on this day, the federal government officially recognises Australian South Sea Islanders as a distinct cultural group. Um, and uh, this day aims to increase recognition and raise awareness of uh, the South Sea Islander culture. Uh, in recognition of this uh, very special day, uh, Victoria Bridge and Story Bridges, Redcliffe Place Sculptures and City Hall will be lit uh, blue, green, white and yellow this evening uh, to mark this special day. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we will celebrate Wear It Purple Day and Wear It Purple Day is about showing LGBTIQ plus young people uh, that they have the right to be proud of who they are. And that is uh, something that's it's a day that strives to foster support. Move for an extension. An extension's been moved by the Deputy, Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Those against say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Ten minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, that is a day that strives to uh, support a supportive, safe and inclusive community environment for young people. Uh, and obviously that is entirely consistent with the approach that council takes as well to an inclusive and tolerant community in Brisbane. And that is one that we absolutely support. Uh, to show our support for Wear It Purple Day, the Story Bridge in Victoria Bridges will be lit up in purple. Uh, on Friday, the Story Bridge, uh, Victoria Bridge, Redcliffe Place Sculptures, the Tropical Dome at the Mount Cutha Botanic Gardens uh, will all be lit up in yellow for, you guessed it, uh, Daffodil Day the Cancer Council special day uh, to raise funds and awareness for uh, cancer research uh, in the ongoing fight to eliminate cancer. Uh, once again, a, a very special uh, day, uh, not only for so many members of the community that are touched by cancer, uh, but also myself um, uh, having my uh, mum diagnosed with breast cancer when I was just a teenager. Um, and uh, yeah, good on you, Councillor Strunk, I see that. Well done. Um, and, and mum is a survivor of, of breast cancer and um, it's you know something very close to my heart. And um, uh, we, we obviously as a council, I wanna continue actively supporting Daffodil Day and cancer research. The items in front of us, uh, item A uh, relates to the Indrapilly Library. Um, council currently occupies lease premises uh, inside of the Indrapilly Shopping Centre. Um, and uh, what we're proposing is to uh, provide a extension to that arrangement with a five-year lease due to commence on the 1st of September, 2020, and continue on for a period of five years. Um, and uh, the premises is uh, 1,699 square metres, um, and that will see an ex uh, a continuation of the provision of a uh, fantastic public library uh, in Indrapilly. Uh, item B relates to the Tawong Library, um, which is located at Tawong Village. Um, and uh, this arrangement commenced all the way back in 2001. Uh, and uh, the lease expires uh, on the 14th of February, 2000, uh, 2021. So that's 14th of February next year, Valentine's Day next year, in fact. Um, and so what we're signing up for is a uh, up to a 15 year lease commencing on the 15th of February next year. Um, and once again, ensuring the continuation of this essential public service for local residents. Uh, it was great um, to fairly recently uh, be um, in the Tuong Library to see the, the recent upgrade that was uh, completed out there. Um, maybe it was late last year maybe it was early this year i can't remember time has flown by but uh, there was a great outcome uh, with that library upgrade and something that is being well used by the community at item c uh, we have the contact contracts and tendering report for um uh the month of june 2020 so june uh, this year and um i can confirm that um things continue to progress with our local procurement policy and our support for local businesses. 
Um, and last year, council spent more than 900, so I'm talking about financial year, last financial year ending the 30, 30th of uh, June, council spent more than $920 million with around 2,000 local businesses. And so this has a real impact. Uh, when you talk about stimulus programs and impacts, I mean, a, a, an almost a billion dollar injection into local businesses, that makes a real difference. Uh, and this is not a this is not a one-off policy. This is not just a COVID response. This is our ongoing procurement approach. We want to see this this level of investment happen year after year, supporting local businesses, growing local businesses, supporting local jobs, supporting local innovation. Um, and it is a great outcome and one that we're committed to continuing in the long term. Uh, equally, council remains committed to. Uh, supporting and fostering social enterprise as well through our procurement policy. And each year we have a target uh, that uh, we will engage um, a significant number of social enterprises to provide services for council. Uh, and so there's examples of where social enterprises are cutting the grass in certain locations, they're providing cleaning services, they're providing a range of other services across the city. And these social enterprises are businesses um, that are effectively uh, profit for purpose. Uh, and by profit for, pur for purpose, I mean the profit is not going uh, into uh, some individual's pocket or a business owner's pocket. The profit is going back to a community group and a charity. And that community group and charity through their social enterprise employs people uh, to really create this ongoing uh, flow on and positive benefit in the community. And so we'll continue through our procurement to support social enterprises. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing uh, to acknowledge. Uh, we have um, in this package as well, um, the, the new contract for um, the provision of ferry services. Uh, and um, in September last year, we brought forward the significant contracting plan um, for the new ferry contract. And so that came to council in September last year and uh, just so everyone's clear, we bring forward a significant contracting plan, which says very clearly how we are going to undertake the procurement process. It also says very clearly what type of things we're looking for in that procurement process, how the process will be run, uh, identifying clearly how the decisions will be made uh, so that councillors all know upfront how this process will run. Uh, and so what we're seeing today is the end of that process uh, with the reporting back to council on the decision that was made in the awarding of the ferry contract. Uh, and um, uh, this decision is a really important one uh, in support of our local procurement as well, because uh, we are seeing the ferry contract going to uh, Australian company Sealink. Uh, and Sealink would be a company that many of you would be familiar with uh, if you've been uh, for example, out to the Bay Islands of Brisbane or Strati, uh, you, would have, um, you would have been on services provided by Sealink. So now we will see uh, Sealink taking over the contract for the operation of ferries. Uh, and they will do so uh, by taking on the staff that are currently employed uh, through Transdev. There's obviously a process underway uh, to move uh, those staff across. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing the continuation of services on the 4th of November when the new contract comes into place uh, and the continuation of the high level of customer service that those staff provide, but also uh, the great corporate benefits that can be brought into this contract by uh, C-Link and their experience in operating uh, ferry and boat services around Australia in many locations. Uh, so this is a really important contract and, and one that um, supports local jobs, uh, supports local business and, and is a key part of our local procurement. This contract has the potential for it to be extended um, up to 15 years in length. Um, and so it's a significant contract in that scheme of things, uh, both in the yearly spend and also the potential length. Uh, but this contract also represents uh, the level of investment uh, that council makes in providing high quality ferry services, uh, providing uh, a service which people, which the people of Brisbane can be truly proud of. Uh, today, we had the launch of the latest and the second double-decker city cap, uh, Neville Bonner. 
And uh, it was a, uh, a moment that brought tears to my eyes. Um, that was mainly because of the smoking ceremony that we had uh, on deck. Uh, and I got a lot of smoke in my eyes. So if I was shedding a tear, it was because of that, I swear. Um, but it was a really special day um, to launch the new generation double decker city cat named Neville Bonner. Uh, and I also announced today that this vessel uh, will fly the Aboriginal flag every single day it is in service. The Aboriginal flag will be flying proudly of this vessel as it was today, um, because I'm so proud of uh, the contribution of our Indigenous community in our city. And I'm so proud of what Neville Bonner did uh, when it comes to uh, not only politics uh, in this country as a pioneer um, and a history maker, uh, but also um, the, the work that he has done through the community and his ancestors are doing when it comes to contributing towards um, a better Brisbane, a better Queensland and a better Australia. So uh, keep a look out for the Neville Bonner on the river. Keep a look out for that Aboriginal flag flying proudly uh, from the vessel. Uh, all of the other vessels will have uh, the Australian Red Ensign flying, but this one will have the Aboriginal flag flying proudly. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, there's a, a range of other contracts there which um, are all about our ongoing provision of services and upgrades and projects across the city. Um, Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Move for an extension. Move for an extension. No. Councillor Adams, second and Councillor Landers, all those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. Those against say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Look, I won't, I won't take the full 10 minutes and thank you uh, very much for your um, patience. Uh, item D is the annual operational plan and quarterly uh, report for June 2020. Um, and uh, item E is the procurement policy. Now, I know the, a number of the chairs will be speaking uh, to the operational plan and quarterly financial report um, uh, for June, uh, but I did want to actually uh, knock on the head uh, one important thing which um, I've heard uh, the opposition is banding around. Now, uh, we recently made the right decision on behalf of the Brisbane residents and the safety of people on the river to pull the wooden monohull ferries off the river. Uh, we have uh, since done a lot of work and assessment um, with independent experts uh, on those ferries. And as I've said previously, that, that decision, I believe, was absolutely the right decision and was fully justified with uh, almost all of those ferries except for one rated as a very high risk um, unless urgent works are done and, and quite significant repair works are done. Uh, we have since then put one of the ferries back on the river uh, and that is doing the cross river service between Belimba and Tenerife. That is a steel hull ferry. So out of the nine mono hull ferries, uh, eight of them have a timber hull and one has a steel hull. The steel hull ferry is back in service, uh, providing services as we speak. Uh, we've changed the uh, CityCat uh, services to start servicing Kangaroo Point, which have never had a CityCat before. Uh, but uh, it was suggested to me earlier today uh, that the opposition was making a claim about one of the items in uh, the annual report and quarterly financial plan. Uh, and that relates to provide ferry services and maintenance. Uh, the suggestion was that there was an underspend there, which somehow was related to the timber mono holes or issues with maintenance of the ferries. That is absolutely not the case. Absolutely not the case. I can tell you that that underspend uh, was related to several things. Uh, first of all, reduce fuel costs. Uh, and we have seen in recent times, uh, periods of very low uh, fuel costs. Um, that is a good thing. That is a saving to the ratepayers of Brisbane and also um, uh, one that can uh, be reinvested into other things. That is money that we had budgeted that we did not spend because fuel costs are down. We also had reduced uh, revenue for special events and charter services, obviously, uh, during COVID. Um, charter services and special events on the, the ferries and city cats, not happening. Um, that is a reality. Uh, we had uh, a reduction in the produ production of information materials and printing, Councillor Cassidy, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this would be a surprise to you, but we're actually uh, spending less on printing um, related to ferry services. Um, and uh, we also had the return of a contingency to Council, which had been budgeted 
for the new ferry contract. Now, um, Councillor Cassidy has spoken a lot about contingencies in this place, particularly contingencies like uh, Kingston Smith Drive. Um, and he has said it's an outrage when a contingency is spent. Well, a contingency uh, is designed exactly for unanticipated events. But in this case, there has been a contingency budgeted and not spent. Yet I predict that we will hear Councillor Cassidy say it's an outrage that there's been an underspend in this particular service area. Councillor Cassidy, you can't have it both ways. Uh, you can't say it's an outrage when you spend the contingency and then it's an outrage when you don't spend the contingency. You've got to have a consistent position. But what I can say is that this particular item in the budget has nothing to do, zero zip zilch with wooden berries. It's as simple as that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will leave my comments at that. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, just at the outset, um, if we could just have uh, item uh, C and D uh, be taken seriatim for voting purposes, please. Item C and D seriatim, but oh, sorry, separately themselves though. So, so C separately and D separately. Understood. So item C will be taken seriatim alone and item D will be taken seriatim alone. Yes, and then the others together. Yeah, that's fine. Um, thanks, Chair. So just running through uh, all of these clauses uh, in alphabetical order. Um, A and B together, though, which is the lease of premises for the Indrapilly Library and the Tawonga Library. Um, the five-year lease for the Indrapilly Library um, seems to be shorter um, due to the plans to redevelop the centre and Tawong Library the option for the 15 years was taken. Uh, it is interesting to note, Chair, that the, um, it has been two years since the Indrapilly Library lease was lapsed, and now we're only seeing the new lease before us today. Um, it's an incredibly long time to be able to get uh, their act together, this administration, to be able to bring a lease before us today, but I suppose better late than never to ensure this library remains open. Uh, reading through the report, um, it was interesting to note that the Indrapilly Library um, gross annual rental is almost now three times uh, what it was previously negotiated under former Lord Mayor Jim Sawley, uh, up from $93,779 in the old lease to $296,837 in the lease proposed uh, by the Lord Mayor today. Now, I only mention this, Chair, because the Lord Mayor is often quick uh, to refer to things that happened in Jim Sawley's time. Well, clearly Sawley was a better negotiator than Lord Mayor Schrinner. In the attachments to Clause A, the Indrapilly Library lease, we were given comparisons of the gross rent with other libraries as a comparison. Um, I was pretty gobsmacked, and I'm sure other councillors are as well, to read that the Wynnum Library, um, at the Wynnum Library, Brisbane residents are forking out about a million dollars a year in rent. Now, that's three times what they'll be paying for the Indrapilly Library, but the important Point and the most astounding thing here, Chair, is that the Wynnum Library is a publicly owned building. It should be the cheapest to rent, not the most expensive to rent. It's the money merry-go-round of CBIC. So council owns CBIC, which then pays rent to CBIC, which then apparently sends that rent back as a dividend um, to be put into some so-called green future fund. Um, and, of course, board members taking their clip on the way through, Chair. So council spends a million dollars paying rent to itself, then pays that rent back to itself and claims that as a glorious dividend, Chair. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary. So you have to ask yourself if that's the case. Uh, and, and we know from previous questions on notice, Chair, that uh, the level of rent paid to council, uh, paid, paid to CBIC far outstrips um, the dividend that comes to council, and here it is before us in black and white. Uh, Clause C, contracts and tendering a report to council. Uh, we've been asked to note a decision by a civic cabinet or, or council's delegates on a number of contracts um, uh, back uh, in June, uh, 21 contracts being outsourced to 37 different companies, totalling uh, around... It's more than $750 million, which is uh, significantly more than uh, what we normally see in these contracts and tendering documents. And once again, there is uh, little or no information provided in, in the ENC report to us or kept on file 
up on level 23 in Brisbane Square. I again went up there hoping that one day, Chair, some information might be on file, uh, and alas, there was not. You would think there were such significant contracts uh, the people of Brisbane deserve to know the details. When it comes to Council's approach to outsourcing, we're seeing more and more examples where contracts have been exempted from tender, uh, which means this Council is not even going to the market to make sure the prison residents are getting the very, be the very best value for money. Out of the 21 before us today, 11 contracts have been approved without going uh, out to competitive tender. That's more than 50% who were stamped for approval by Civic Cabinet without seeking any other suppliers whatsoever. Now, uh, we accept, Chair, that there are times when a single supplier may be appropriate or required on rare occasions, um, but you have to wonder whether Brisbane residents are getting the very best value for money when more than half of the contracts aren't even going out to competitive tender. Uh, so going through some of these contracts, Chair, Contract one is half a million dollar contract going to my site of design for the provision of the consultation manager system, a software system for council to track dealings with stakeholders, uh, an extension of an existing contract so it didn't go to market. How do we know that this was the best tool for the job, uh, um, whether this was good value for money uh, for the ratepayers of Brisbane? Contract three is three quarters of a million dollar contract for auction services for vehicles, plant and equipment. Um, pretty run of the mill, you'd think. Uh, it has been awarded to a subsidiary of a North American company and they have a premises here, but they're part of a multinational organisation. So, so much for buy local when other tenderers were actually locally owned and operated. Uh, and that the contract goes to an international company in this case. Contract for the refurbishment of the Southern Regional Skate Parks is about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, it did not go out to tender either. Uh, and it also doesn't say which skate parks are being done and what is being done at them. Contract five is another one which didn't go out to tender. Contract to assess the proposal to integrate traffic management centre for council's tollways. Uh, there's no detail of when this work's going to be undertaken and uh, when councillors and residents will be advised of the findings of that review. We suspect never when it comes to this administration, Chair. Contract six is a $4 million contract to upgrade the intersection of River Terrace and Main Street. This is higher than the estimated maximum expenditure for the project, allegedly due to possible delay costs. Uh, we'd love to know what type of delays are anticipated by Council and what is the time of these possible delays and what impact could these have on the project delivery. Contract seven is just over $200,000 for nine mobile variable messaging signs. It'd be great to know how and when these will be used. Contract eight is $1.1 million for stationary gantry elements for the William Jolly Bridge, which is an 88-year-old bridge uh, this year. Assume this is for investigation works on the bridge. Um, how exactly they will be used, what the issues that have been uncovered that have led to the need for these investigative works would be appreciated. Uh, some investigations were done earlier this month. Is there any news coming out of those investigations that we should be aware of? Uh, contract 9 chair is another example of a construction contract where there is higher than an estimated maximum expenditure for the project, again, allegedly due to possible delay costs. Again, what are the delays that are anticipated and what is the time of these project delays? What impact could this have on project delivery and council's budget bottom line? Contract 10 is a $2 million contract to the Department of Transport and Main Roads for Incident Management Services. A sole source contract with no tenderers. What sort of services are provided as part of this contract? And um, were was DTMR the only um, the only proponent that could have um, provided these services or not, we will never know. Uh, in contract 12, it's extraordinary. Now, Lord Mayor has um, touched on this a little bit in his opening remarks. I understand there was a significant contracting plan that went through Council uh, last year, which set out the parameters of uh, what we needed in terms of a um, City Cat and Ferry um, service contract. But this, this is now a contract uh, that has been awarded um, a $633 million contract uh, simply for councillors to note that this decision 
has been made and councillors are expected to just note um, uh, and, you know, an unelected council bureaucrat has um, been designated and delegated the decision-making authority to do this. Um, this would be, Chair, the largest, most significant contract uh, about an important public transport service delivery where the Chamber has absolutely uh, no role in awarding the contract. Now, there was a approval to go out to market, yes, uh, but councillors have absolutely uh, no meaningful um, decision-making process over the awarding of $633 million for this contract. There will be other significant contracts that come to council. We deal with them from time to time, but those decisions are made in the council chamber. So we have been asked um, to note this project and uh, we think that's um, a very poor decision-making process um, to expend this, this amount of public money. Uh, we're not talking about the merits um, of the contract going to a local company. Uh, that is good. Um, but the process in which $633 million... Time has expired. Extension moved by Councillor Strunk. Seconded by Councillor Griffiths. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. Those against say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Please Thanks, continue. Chair. So $633 million is an awful lot of money uh, for councillors simply to note a decision having been made about. Uh, contract 13 is a $300,000 contract for digital scanning services have been awarded again to a sole contractor without undertaking a tender process. Uh, this one um, apparently has been exempted as the, um, as the um, successful um, provider is a social enterprise. We, of course, support Council's um, contract opportunities for social enterprises, but would like some more details about what exactly is undertaken as part of the contract. Uh, contract 14, this is uh, a $1.2 million contract for creative and digital service, and they've been awarded to a panel of eight businesses. It's yet another one of the 11 out of the 21 before us today where there was no competitive tender process, though. This time, apparently, uh, it was in the public interest not to go to tender. Um, I don't understand, Chair, and I'd love an explanation how it is not in the public interest to seek competitive tenders for something like creative and digital service. Uh, I don't think we're talking about, um, you know, an entity who, when it comes to relocating um, services, if it's a, um, a Telstra service, the Telstra needs to relocate, then fair enough, Telstra does that work. But we're talking about something as simple as creative and digital services, and this administration has said it's not in the public interest to seek competitive tenders. Um, we have no idea about what is being delivered. Maybe, uh, maybe it's all services, uh, digital and creative services for the Lord Mayor's self-promotion pieces uh, that go out to the tune of $6.5 million a year. In contract 15, another significant contract worth uh, $24.5 million over uh, the next 13 years. Uh, and while shortlisted, the previous provider, Motorola, was not successful. Uh, instead, the contract has been awarded to Tate Electronics. And, um, you know, we would like to see what the thinking was around this, given, um, uh, you know, the, the 13 years of um, uh, services going forward. And um, there's very little uh, detail here being provided to us for a significant contract about uh, what the thinking was around that. Contract 16 is uh, $8.75 million in Arbor services. And this is an important one for council to get right yet. There, there, and, and the most important question to be asked here is why this service continues to be contracted out when it could be done in-house. Contract labour, uh, and this is, you know, using the LNP's own words when this has been raised in the past, uh, are used for things that aren't ongoing. Contract labour should only be used for work that is not ongoing. But tree services certainly are day-to-day -day bread and butter um, matters for this council. Uh, they are cyclical. They're programmed in every three months. Uh, um, tree trimming is done in different parts of the city and is done uh, each and every month of the year. Uh, this is a basic service and there's no reason um, why these sort of services can't be brought in-house. Uh, there's a lot of talk by this Lord Mayor Chair about buy local. Um, there's nothing more local to Brisbane City Council than its employees, and there's nothing more buy local uh, than employing local chair. Um, so this is a contract uh, that should be given serious consideration to be, to be brought in-house. 
Contract 17 is another sole source contract exempted under under the procurement policy. And this one's for $3.75 million for externally hosted geographic information system. Um, some information about what that is and how that information uh, will be gathered and will be used, I think is important to know. Contract 18, another contract which didn't go out for competitive tender, $2.8 million for Quarry and Asphalt um, mobile plant. It's not clear why council couldn't seek competitive tenders for this contract chair and would certainly welcome an explanation for that one. Now, contract 19 is a big one. It's $40 million software licensing um, agreement with Microsoft Ireland. Uh, again, exempt from competitive tendering, uh, uh, but I bet they're not paying any tax dollars here in Australia either, Chair. Uh, with a cool $40 million being sent to a company in Ireland, it's not even a buy Australian, let alone buy local chair on this contract. Uh, contract 20 is half a million dollars for ICT management tool, which is again a sole contractor with the process exempt uh, from competitive tendering. Um, some uh, information on that would certainly be appreciated. And contract uh, 21 is for uh, $1.5 million in water quality testing by QUU. This is the last of the 11 contracts that didn't um, get competitive tenders, so the competitive tenders weren't sought. Um, some information on exactly what is being tested here and how the results will be used will be appreciated. Uh, understandable, QU know what they're talking about when it comes to water, but I'm sure there are plenty of um, operators out there who could also um, tender for this to ensure that we have the very best value for money. Now, moving on to Clause D, Chair. This is the end of the financial year report on the 1920 council budget. There is a lot mentioned about the, co uh, the impacts of COVID-19 uh, in here, uh, but let's get real, Chair. The impacts mainly started to hit from around April onwards uh, in the last financial quarter of the last financial year. Now, I can tell you what the pandemic hasn't impacted on, uh, Mr Chair. It's this Lord Mayor's appetite for self-promotion. We can't see anywhere in this review where the Lord Mayor um, showed that he was prepared to cut his glossy self-promotion materials and advertising. Uh, it doesn't matter how difficult things must get in this city. The Lord Mayor won't miss out on getting his face out in letterboxes across Brisbane uh, at the moment, running at a pretty uh, sweet $1.2 million plus each and every year just on the living in Brisbane brochures, let alone everything else, Chair. If he was genuine about how tough things are, he would cut this rort. When it comes to debt in these papers, Chair, Council's debt levels haven't just climbed, they've skyrocketed. At the end of June 2019, Council's debt-to-income ratio uh, was around 61%. Fast forward to June 2020, uh, it's reached an astronomical 106%, and it's only partly due to changes in accounting standards for leases. In dollar terms, Council's debt was $1.87 billion at the end of June 2019. Again, fast forward a year, uh, it's blown out to $2.61 billion, an increase of $745 million. In 2008, the state Labor government wiped Council's debt clean completely. Council had no debt. 12 years later, it has ballooned under this administration with successive Lord Mayors. And what do we have to show for a chair? The unfinished Kingsford Smith Drive project and a phantom metro to date. But revenue is up, chair. Uh, while it is down in some areas in grants, interests and dividends, revenue is up from June 2019 to June 2020. Rates and utility charges were up $26 million. Fees and charges were up $2 million. Public transport revenue was up. GST back from the Australian Tax Office was up. Compared to the 1920 budget allocations uh, and projections, revenue from Council's car parks at King George Square and Wickham Terrace delivered an extra $1.5 million more than expected uh, and uh, close to an extra $1.5 million from parking meter revenue. So, and even despite the um, uh, COVID impacts on Council's budget bottom line, we can see that Council's revenue to the end of June uh, 2020 uh, is up across most areas, which um, makes uh, this Lord Mayor's um, fake rates freeze harder to swallow for residents, I think, Chair, uh, when uh, the rates increases just kick down the road uh, until January and then residents will be faced with another rates increase uh, in June of the same year. 
Now, um, on to Brisbane Metro uh, in this document, Chair. Uh, the Lord Mayor's um, Bendy Bus project continues to deliver bad news for his administration and bad news for his budget. Um, the Lord Mayor has been in charge of the so-called Metro uh, from the beginning. Back in 2016, it was going to be a high-frequency subway system. We all saw the glossy advertising and artist impressions of red brick stations underground. Uh, but what we see here is revenue uh, down by $30 million for the Brisbane Metro because of this Lord Mayor's poor planning. Uh, it has held up funding once again. Uh, we heard the Lord Mayor just before Chair talk about the progress that is being made or the so-called progress that is being made. Uh, he's trying to uh, cover his incompetence, Chair, through um, trying to cover it through an approval process. But I don't think it takes uh, five years to get a very small, short and simple busway extension um, approved, um, we know this is all on the Lord Mayor's head. Um, I would um, be very wary of even getting him to organise a chook raffle chair. Um, so through you, Chair, to the Lord Mayor, I think this is coming close to uh, his chance um, to perhaps call it a day on the Brisbane Metro uh, chair. Clearly for him, it's all too hard. It, it, it's it, it seems to be beyond this Lord Mayor to get this metro right. And perhaps it's time for him to admit that he got it wrong and uh, pack up his kit right. bag. Your time has expired. Move, uh, extension move by Councillor Strunk. Uh, and Councillor Cumming, all those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Those against say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy, 10 minutes. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, so I, I think the time is... Uh, probably coming near where this Lord Mayor is going to have to start seriously considering walking away uh, from this white elephant and starting all over again. Uh, and the rest of this budget document is the story of cuts, delays and blowouts. Um, and, you know, Lord Mayor um, touched on this item uh, and he, he said some interesting things, particularly the $3.42 million underspend, uh, which is in the latest in a long series of chronic underspends when it comes to uh, ferry maintenance on this administration's watch. Um, uh, and it, 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 of course, coincides uh, with the end of this ferry contract that we see. And, and um, if we believe the Lord Mayor's words, um, the ferries were left in a pretty poor state. Uh, and when the budget line item says that there was a significant underspend in the maintaining ferry services, uh, what are we to think? Well, the Lord Mayor says, the Lord Mayor says that there were lower fuel costs and um, a couple uh, fewer chartered events, is how he explained that away uh, in his remarks. Um, fuel costs haven't fluctuated all that much from the uh, when the budget was handed down in June 2019 to the end of June 2020. We haven't seen wild variations in fuel, and, and if anything, if anything, Chair, uh, fuel has been the cheapest it has it has been. Uh, consistently for a long time. So uh, you would think that an administration that uh, is able to properly budget um, for uh, fuel costs uh, would, would have taken that into account. But he didn't say how much uh, was accounted for in fuel costs being lower, Chair. Uh, in chartered events, Chair, like, you know, come on, be serious. We know those things. People pay uh, to charter those events. They pay for themselves. Like, it, the, we don't have to outlay all this money, Chair, um, to have people pay us um, to use city cats on the river for special events. And that's not happening every night of the week. So how the Lord Mayor um, can explain a $3.42 million underspend on ferry maintenance by saying they used a little less fuel or fuel was a couple of cents a litre cheaper uh, and a few people didn't charter um, city cats uh, is, uh, is beyond any reason, Chair. So I think a... A more detailed and a proper explanation needs to be given uh, because it is no coincidence. There's no coincidence that successive successive budget reviews show that there's been underspend on ferry maintenance. We get to the end of the line uh, on a ferry contract and all of a sudden, apparently, these boats are kaput. Um, I think uh, uh, we need to have a deeper look at this chair. Essential fundamental council services like footpath reconstruction and safer paths to schools is down by $9.42 million, but at the same time, revenue is up by $1.8 million from infrastructure charges, as well as footpath and bikeway uh, contributed assets. 
Uh, so when our streets are lined with broken uh, and busted footpaths, we shouldn't be seeing delays in these projects being rolled out. We should be seeing these fast-tracked, particularly in the context of um, so-called shovel-ready projects uh, in our community that need to be uh, fast-tracked to support our COVID response. There's big talk, uh, but there's very, very little action, Chair. The infrastructure program revenue is up by 41%, but capital spending is down by over 10% across the board. Uh, the report shows delays to bikeway upgrades, pedestrian safety improvements, LATMs, road corridor work, story bridge restoration. You name it, Chair, there is a delay on it. Uh, in the Clean, Green, Sustainable City program, revenue is up by nearly $14 million, but spending on the environment is down by $18 million. More dollars uh, in for, from environmental programs, but um, through you to the Lord Mayor Chair, uh, you haven't spent what was promised in the 1920 budget. Uh, so the Lord Mayor talks a big um, game about the Green Fund from CBIC profits, uh, but half a dozen of those projects have been pushed out, delayed, and potentially never delivered, Chair. There are delays to flood gauges, koala research projects, park upgrades across various Brisbane suburbs, delays in plantings in six suburbs, stormwater drainage, and land remediation. We know some of the issues were um, due to supply chain difficulties um, due to COVID-19 with products being sourced for local playgrounds from overseas suppliers by this LNP administration. Even grass cuts in Brisbane were cut, Chair. Uh, green waste initially looked like there was going to be an increase in uptake, uh, but the reality is it was down. The last review downgraded the number of households expected to take the service from 12,000 down to 9,000. The report has it at 10,390. Uh, so um, you would expect going from one quarter to the next, that looks okay, uh, but going from the start of the budget to the end of the budget, uh, it's actually a very, very poor outcome. Uh, imagine if this service was extended to become a fully blown food organics, garden organics service chair. And just like Labor and thousands of Brisbane residents are calling for, the Gold Coast has just signed up for it. Uh, surely uh, Brisbane can go fully FOGO as well, Chair. It's not that hard. It's just um, that the Lord Mayor's heart just doesn't seem to be in it. In the Lifestyle and Community Services Program, capital funding was underspent by 20%. That's a fifth of the capital budget for that program, simply not done. You might expect, Chair, that expenses would be down um, a bit with events being postponed or cancelled, um, but capital expenditure being down uh, by this amount is absolutely alarming, particularly in the context of these projects should have been carried out um, during um, the COVID lockdown. The administration talks big about supporting the community during COVID-19, Chair, but uh, when we see the delays to the implementation of Brisbane's access and inclusion plan, sports field rehabilitation, clubs and community centre structural repairs and maintenance, as well as Brisbane Powerhouse Works and Cemetery Works, how heartless, and not to mention the disastrous mess that is left at the School of Arts Refurbishment Project. Now, after calls from Labor, the administration finally announced works two years ago, uh, but they have been delayed again um, and with no end in sight, Chair. Um, absolutely uh, extraordinary. Um, it, this should have been and this should have showed us that at the end of that financial year, the administration had a nimble response to COVID and was ramping up uh, infrastructure spends, and not only what was allocated in the budget, but getting ready for a significant boost to our community to deal with the aftermath of COVID-19. But what it shows in black and white here today, uh, Chair, is just a business as usual approach from this administration. Uh, Finally, Chair Clause E, the procurement policy and um, contracting plan for 2021. Um, as we raise, as I raised in uh, contracts and tendering in Clause C, there are more and more reports uh, where contracts are being put, um, not put out to competitive tender. Um, we have concerns what that means in terms of value for money for Brisbane residents. We see more services being contracted out when they're contracted out. Um, they're not even put out to competitive tender after the first um, after the first round chair. Um, we have concerns about the delegations. For example, how does a $633 million contract get delegated to a council bureaucrat for decision and not to mention the so-called buy local um, policy that the Lord Mayor um, talks a big game about, but we know uh, it is not all that it seems. Time and time again, we see contracts supposedly going to local businesses when in reality they're often going to companies that have just an administration office here in Brisbane and the main part of their business 
uh, is overseas or, or interstate. We've seen how this has impacted on council's ability to deliver projects on time and on budget uh, during COVID-19 when the supply chain was affected and important projects had to be held up. We've seen playground upgrades delayed because equipment was held up in Europe, yet allegedly these are local companies. The Lord Mayor needs to do better, chair and support local businesses by making sure council is not just awarding contracts to businesses with an office here, a shop front, but actually sources locally and supports local industry as well. Thank you. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Landers. Point of order, Chair. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton. This Council now adjourn for a period of 15 minutes for the purpose of afternoon tea, commencing when all councillors have left this meeting. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Thank aye. you. Again, say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. We'll see you in 15 minutes.
Councillors, are there any further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, uh, I rise to speak on item C and in specific, uh, specifically contract uh, three, uh, sorry, five, three, four, four, two, which is the Beach Street uh, bridge connection. Uh, this is a great outcome for the community. The, the genesis of this bridge actually started at the Fernie Grove State School PNC, uh, where we put it to the community to identify areas of uh, active travel that had gaps in them. Uh, and this bridge was one of those that came up. Uh, I went out to the site, uh, had a look around, uh, and the kids from the Fernie Grove State High School had actually engineered their own crossing. And to their credit, it was absolutely fantastic. They'd engineered it out of stepping stones and an old uh, diff from an old Holden HQ. So all credit to the high school kids. They had done a fantastic job to create a, a creek crossing here. Uh, when, the, uh, when the Lord Mayor was the chairman of active travel, the school PNC and myself worked together to actually put forward a submission to create uh, a creek crossing here at this bridge. And um, we put the submission to the Lord Mayor and last year we received uh, funding to do the engineering for the bridge. And this year we had received funding for the construction of the bridge. Uh, so at the last Fernie Grove PNC that I went to, which was last week, uh, announced to the PNC that we would be starting construction on this bridge this week. And uh, they actually asked me to pass on their thanks to the Lord Mayor uh, for the consideration of the funding, but also for the consideration of the submission when, uh, when he was the active travel chair. This bridge connection is going to facilitate uh, a creek crossing where there currently is not a serviceable creek crossing for anybody who has uh, a bicycle or a scooter. This creek crossing is actually going to connect the shopping centre around the Fernie Grove Coles, uh, the high school and the primary school with uh, Upper Kedron along uh, Cedar Creek. There is a uh, an existing bike path there, and this is the only gap that is actually left in that connection. And it is going to be a great asset for the community. Uh, it closes an active travel loop uh, or an active travel gap in the creek network, in the bike creek network, and it will be a well used and much loved uh, connection between Fooney Grove and Upper Kedron for anybody who is on a bike or a scooter or a pedestrian. The bridge connection also has the benefit of connecting the residents of Fernie Grove to one of their uh, parks that's in Gelatin, uh, Gelatin Place Park. Um, Councillor Wines would know Gelatin Place Park very well. Uh, he did the last playground upgrade there. Uh, and it's a great little park, uh, not far from Fernie Grove. However, the only uh, area that, that, that stops the movement of pedestrians is the creek. And this will remove that and uh, kids from Fernie Grove will be able to head off on their cycles or on their scooters uh, right along the creek, um, get off at Gelatin Place Park and kick a football around. And this is a fantastic outcome for the whole community. So I'd like to thank uh, the Lord Mayor firstly for considering the submission when he was the Chair of Active Travel and also uh, as Mayor for providing the funding for this connection. Uh, this is going to be a absolutely wonderful outcome for the community and uh, I wish to pass on my thanks uh, from my community to the Lord Mayor, uh, the Chair for Infrastructure, Councillor McLaughlin as well, uh, and um, Councillor Ryan Murphy as current Active Chair for this great outcome uh, for my community. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on all five items if I have time, and I would ask that item E is taken seriatim for voting purposes. Item E seriatim for voting. <clears throat> uh, firstly, can I say um, I was quite shocked um, by what Councillor Cassidy has said before, and I'd really appreciate it perhaps if the Finance Chairman is going to speak, if he confirms it, um, that the cost of the Wynnum 
uh, library, and I think there's a community centre there too, is a million dollars um, versus the cost for the Indrapilly uh, library that we've got here before us today, which I think is an extraordinary amount of money in a major commercial shopping centre. Um, and I was very surprised to hear that the Wynnum Library, which, yes, our company, i.e. Brisbane City Council, the ratepayers own through the CBIC, um, is paying huge, phenomenal um, rent. So I I'd certainly like that uh, confirmed and I'd certainly like to know um, why uh, there's such a big price differential because I can tell you now, in Trapilly Shopping Town aren't cheap when it comes to the rents. So, um, obviously, they're both important libraries and we need them. Um, but again, value for money in the current market is uh, an issue. Um, with respect to the contacts and uh, tendering report, um, I'm a little bit concerned that this report is for June and it's now the 25th of August. I don't know why there's been such a delay in bringing uh, this matter forward for consideration uh, by council. Um, there are a number of things of concern in here to me, like Councillor Cassidy, um, Council's failure to undertake tenders where appropriate um, and, in my view, necessary. It, it's not happening, and I'll address that more fully when I speak on item E. Um, but this Council has stopped... Um, this Council has really stopped uh, seeking value for money for ratepayers' funds, in my view, um, and uh, is avoiding scrutiny by testing the market. Um, and that is problematic. Uh, not only um, is there no tender being done, um, this matter has been decided by stores boards, so there's no independent oversight um, of the process. Um, unnamed council officers have decided that this is what will happen and, and unnamed council officers have approved it. So again, and I've said this for the past decade, I don't believe that this is an appropriate course of action. We are accountable to ratepayers for um, the expenditure of funds in uh, Brisbane City Council. The one that sticks out, though, uh, is the $1.2 million for creative and digital services. Um, and again, contracts are being entered into without uh, competitive tenders. Um, and there are a number of organisations um, that are being awarded, I presume, panel type um, scenario, um, no explanation whatsoever about what $1.2 million in marketing uh, is going to be for. Um, and do I think it is reasonable that I, as the councillor for Tennyson, representing 30,000 people who pay some of the highest rates in the city, ask the question, what is council spending $1.2 million on in a sweetheart deal with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight marketing companies. I'd like to know. I'm pretty sure the people of Brisbane would like to know. Um, there's just no uh, description of the services. There is no explanation of what it's for. And it is a huge amount of money. Um, and I think this council needs to be accountable. The LMP have forgotten what the word means. Um, absolutely forgotten what the word means. And uh, to the finance chairman through you, Mr. Chair, um, perhaps he can tell us um, these eight PR companies, what are they going to spend $1.2 million on um, in 12 months? 12 months, $1.2 million. I don't think that's good enough. Uh, but it's item E that I particularly want to address. Um, and uh, I'll just say this, um, I do not support the way in which council is going about uh, its procurement processes and I won't be voting for this item uh, before us today. Um, I've said this every single time, I say it when all of these contracts come up, council um, has delegated too much power away uh, from councillors and the public accountability we have for the expenditure of ratepayers' funds. I do not believe this is the right course of action. Um, I do not believe that council officers behind closed doors should be allowed to make multi-million dollar decisions, often hundreds of millions of dollars in decisions, um, without any oversight by the elected officials. Um, so many contracts in this city are going wrong. 
they are going wrong because uh, they are not getting proper oversight and scrutiny. And I firmly believe that we should be approaching this in a uh, different way. We are elected to make decisions on behalf of the people of uh, Brisbane, and that's what we should be doing. Um, so, uh, again, I put on the record my concern, um, which is increasing. Um, you know, this morning, this is, this is, this is what LMP councillors think governance is. And this is why I'm concerned. And if anybody in Brisbane is is asking, well, hang on a minute, they're all trustworthy people. Um, in committee this morning, uh, we had a uh, discussion about an amendment to the minutes. And the chairperson of the committee said to me, I've been told I can't make an amendment to the minutes of the committee. And I'm like, this is a statutory committee of elected uh, councillors who attended the meeting last year and all agreed that something was discussed that wasn't Point of order, Mr. Chair. Yeah, point of order, Councillor Adams. Um, my question is relevance for um, Councillor Johnson on this item. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thanks, um, Deputy mm. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Johnson, I appreciate that uh, you're talking about matters regarding the council, but can I please bring you back to the matters in the report? Yes, thank you. And um, I'm drawing the comparison that... Um, the chairman of that committee had no understanding of her uh, rights uh, and responsibilities um, with respect to um, uh, the minutes. And that's what this that somebody, a presumably a council officer, told her she could not do this. No, so that. the no, issue here no, is no, that no. council officers should not be um, making these decisions without proper oversight of councillors. We are elected and we are responsible for the actions of this city. Um, these issues need to be discussed in public. They need to be um, oversighted transparently um, and there needs to be rigorous procurement processes applied. Um, the process we've got now is um, even major projects are not coming up to council uh, for decision. Uh, by tenderer. Uh, they're being made by stores boards and then signed off by the CEO. That's just not acceptable um, in my view. Um, so I don't support uh, item E. Um, I believe there should be more transparency and scrutiny. These matters should be coming to full council. There should be tenders. Um, there should be um, competitive markets. Um, and this idea that council uh, this idea that council is going to delegate its powers for procurement away even further is not acceptable in my view, and I don't support it. Further speakers? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on items A and B, the leasing of the premises for the Indrapilly Library and the Tawong Library. And I'd like to begin with a history lesson as to why these important facilities should uh, remain as a cornerstone of our community. Now, Chair, you might know that the Tawong Library was opened all the way back in 1961 after it was designed by Birrell. It was built on Coronation Drive in a, in a modernist style and it created a lot of controversy in its day. And we think we have a lot of controversy now, but um, it was designed and built to service all the suburbs around that area, Tawong, Taringa, St. Lucia, all the way out to Kenmore, believe it or not. And then they realized back in the, in, their, in the day when I was only four years old, that, hey, maybe we need to have more libraries in this area. So they opened the Indrapilly Library in 1982. And they thought the Indrapilly Library is so good and so big that we can shut down the Tawong Library. And they did. Council shut down the Tawong Library in 1982. And guess what? Community was up in arms, Chair. So they reopened it back in 1983 after public pressure. That was a very short closure. And it just shows how important these libraries are for our local area. Um, it was altered again in 1983 to be a, a ward office. And then it was heritage listed in 1998. And then in 2001, it was shifted from that building up to its current location <clears throat> in Tuong Village. And last year, it was um, there on the 3rd of August, there was the, the grand reopening and the Lord Mayor came along and um, he was with my favourite author, local constituent here, uh, Nick Earls, who's um, written many books about Brisbane. And we should be very happy with the facilities that 
this Brisbane City Council administration provides for our community because libraries just aren't about books anymore, Chair. They um, provide meeting rooms, Wi-Fi for people who don't have that at home, all sorts of different facilities. And the Indrapilly Library is a seven day a week service. And it is next to one of the busiest movie cinemas in Brisbane. So it does get a big crowd going through it. And the Tawong Library has a lot of students with its proximity to UQ. And that means that both of these facilities are ex uh, essential to the fabric and the makeup of the Walter Taylor community. Um, and I will just point out that both are located on very impressive transport hubs, including bus interchanges and uh, train stations. And obviously the Tawong Village Library is right above the Tawong Station. And Indrapilly has 4,700 car parks if you don't want to catch public transport. There are bike facilities. The Tawong Library is right on the end of the Bicentennial Bikeway. So these are essential to um, the people of Walter Taylor to continue the, um, the facilities in our area would just mean so much. And I'm so glad to see that these leases renewals are coming before council and I commend the motions. Further the speakers. Councillor Strunk. Councillor Strunk, can you please turn on your microphone? Yep, thank you. Um, I just want to speak briefly on item D in one uh, one item in uh, in clause uh, E. Um, so, um, Mr. Chair, um, I was looking at the um, uh, the uh, explanation for variances, right? Uh, page fifty seven in uh, clause D, and uh, came across a uh, management services system. Uh, in organizational services, which was um, uh, not a lot of money, $340,000, but uh, uh, I was a bit curious, and, and maybe the finance chair, if he's going to address some of our queries, if his voice holds out. Um, the, uh, the, the item here says, lower than anticipated remeasurement of the defined benefit plan and rates revenue, the variances is partly offset by higher than anticipated grant revenues. Um, but there was really three items there uh, that stand out for me in regards to three words actually, and that is defined and uh, rates revenue. I think we know what that means, but uh, and grants revenue, but I just don't see how they all uh, end up in the one um, explanation. So maybe the, um, uh, the uh, finance chair could explain that one for me. I would appreciate that. Um, uh, and it's uh, unfavorable and it's permanent. So, uh, but again, not a lot of money, $340,000. Uh, the second item is just directly below, uh, which is the management of financial systems. Uh, and it's lower than anticipated expenditure in the management of financial systems and process services. The variance is also due to a higher anticipated uh, imp, 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 impute, uh, inputted, sorry, inputted or I-M-P-U-T-E-D income tax uh, and, uh, and lower than anticipated uh, bank charges. So um, if you could sort of demystify that one for me too, I would be much appreciated. Uh, on the following page, uh, page 58, um, there is a, another one which is unfavorable and permanent, uh, higher than anticipated expenditure uh, due to corporate adjustments. Now, I um, understand all those words, but what corporate adjustments are we talking about? Is, was there one corporate adjustment or a series of corporate adjustments? And this was in regards to management of financial systems and processes. So uh, again, I'm just asking the question on that one. Um, if we move to one item that um, popped up for me when I was going through the uh, uh, Clause E uh, in regards to the uh, goods and services significance, right, uh, the schedules. Um, and I was reading the, uh, uh, the explanation at the top of those, which says detail below 
or anticipated significant contracts in relation to goods and services against which major procurement activity is scheduled to occur during the 2020-21 financial year and later. And one of the items that, uh, as I say, popped out for me was, uh, was uh, on page 19, uh, and it's uh, under uh, refuge uh, collection and disposal. And that item is the curbside large item collection service uh, earmarked for $4 million to happen in the second quarter of this financial year. Now, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Lord Mayor, um, is there some uh, news that you're going to impart in the second quarter of this year in regards to curbside collection? Have you been holding out on this uh, through you, Mr. Chair? Uh, will there be a really good announcement coming up in the fourth or in the second quarter, Lord Mayor? Um, I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Allen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Look, I'm going to um, just enter the debate on items C, D and E. And uh, in particular, I think I'll just start with item D. Um, the annual operating progress plan and quarterly report reflects Council's financial results for the year ended the 30th of June 2020 in relation to Council's budget and records the variances in the delivery of the annual plan. This shows the budget position for the year ended June 2020, taking into account any changes that were made in the third budget review. In addition, this report gives an overview of the commercial operations and financial well-being of Council's business activities. Any financial changes reported that are permanent and require a change in the budget are dealt with through the budget review process. All differences in the final report are considered permanent. In the context of this report, I would note that Council continues to meet its key financial ratios and targets. Council's total equity since June 2019 has increased mainly due to comprehensive revaluations of infrastructure assets undertaken by independent uh, consultants, and this was undertaken in the 2019-2020 year. Um, comprehensive revaluations are undertaken at regular intervals of no more than five years in accordance with requirements under the accounting standards. The asset revaluation process is predominantly undertaken by independent external values, valuers, as I indicated, and this has seen Council's net assets and community equity grow from $20.89 billion to $23.72 billion. In a number of cases, we've seen delays to some projects across Council as a result of the COVID pandemic. This obviously remains an issue outside of our control. The reports also show other items of interest, including an increase of $16.5 million in Council's accumulated surplus due to an increase in operating capability for the year, and it ended up at 164.5. And for those of you who record or recall the budget process uh, in June um, 19, um, June 2019, we targeted a, a surplus of $300 million. And obviously, uh, during the course of the 1920 uh, 20 year, we, uh, we saw a, a dilution in that um, operating capability. And uh, this is partly offset by an increase to the opening accumulated surplus, mainly as a result of the application of new lease and revenue accounting standards. And I would note that Councillor Cassidy is fairly quick to uh, jump on the debt figures, but every time he does that, um, irrespective of the fact that it's a result of accounting standard changes, he conveniently forgets to mention the assets that have come across onto the balance sheet. And what we have found as we've gone through this process of um, adopting the accounting standards is that those assets that have come onto the balance sheet far outweigh the debt that's appeared there. Um, in the context of the Program 8, um, we've um, seen a, uh, a bit of a, an increase in actual revenue during the, the full year of $7.9 million. Not a lot of money, but uh, all the same, it's good to be able to get a little bit of a tick up uh, in this environment. Um, in terms of the questions that Councillor Strunk raised, I will take those on notice. 
and see if I can come back to him. I think that there was a, a number of fairly um, uh, pointed questions there. Um, moving on to item E, which is SP 103, the Procurement Policy and Plan for 2020-21. Um, Council under the City of Brisbane regulation is required to prepare and adopt the Procurement Policy and Plan each year. Council is required to adopt a contracting plan each financial year that outlines the delegations and market assessment for contracts, as well as the key contracts and significant contracts Council proposes to enter during the year. The contracting plan and associated contracts can be found towards the back of SP 103, the procurement policy and plan, and includes an estimation of the value of the proposed contracts. And obviously, as the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier, um, the aggregate of those contracts is quite large. Um, it's important to note that the cost estimations, especially for new significant contracts, are just that. They are just estimations at a point in time. Procurement and contract costs are refined during the pre and post market stages when procuring services. With reference to the 2020-21 procurement policy and plan, there are some key changes. Firstly, there has been a general improvement of content structure to clearly identify the three elements required by the regulation, namely the procurement policy, the contracting plan and the contract manual. We've also updated the overview section to provide context from the regulation. We've broadened and retitled the section on sustainable procurement to ethical procurement, incorporating a wider range of council objectives, such as ongoing support for local and small businesses. And already council has a good history of spending locally, but we recognize the importance of local business to our economy, especially during and post COVID. And we already have 80% of council's contractual spend with local suppliers. We're also streamlining the Better Brisbane proposal process and we're supporting the intent of the Commonwealth's Modern Slavery Act 2018. Additionally, we've introduced our obligations under the Human Rights Act 2019, which commenced in January 2020. The availability of budget has been clarified to remain consistent with the regulation. And as many people know, funds must be available in the approved council budget for tenders, proposals or quotes of sort, except where the lack of funding is disclosed in the publicly available documents and strategy is approved by the chief executive officer. We are dedicated to finding new ways to improve our procurement process and policy. Again, this year, I'm pleased to note that we continue our commitment to social enterprises with $6 million of procurement from social enterprises. And uh, I have a couple in the Northgate ward who are very happy recipients of those particular um, uh, procurement uh, tenders. Um, Councillor Cassidy raised a number of points on contracts and uh, in the time I've got left, I'll try and address those. Um, contract 13, and this contract is for the provision of digital scanning services. Digital services allows for the digitization of public on-demand requests for building applications, planning and development assessment files, and other ad hoc documents and records. By digitizing records, Council can meet its legislative requirements to provide digital public on-demand file requests, reduce physical storage space, and the cost of storage and administration, and improve preservation of records to comply with legislative retention periods. The contract is for scanning and electronic filing of building applications, development assessment files, and other scanning requirements as detailed by council. The tenderer Jigsaw Group is a social enterprise with extensive digital scanning experience and all work will be performed locally in Brisbane. Moving on to contract 14, creative and digital services. Council requires the ongoing provision of creative and digital services. Um, a specification and schedule of rates uh, review commenced in late 2019 in preparation for tendering council's requirements. During the review process, a strategy to incorporate signage requirements into the tender as a separate category was adopted, requiring a specification to be formulated. Council's approached the Queensland government regarding its purchasing arrangements for creative solutions, however, Council's digital services requirements weren't covered sufficiently, making the option unviable. Corporate communication has continued reviewing and drafting specifications 
Uh, delays have been experienced from COVID and the 12 month extension to the current CPA will allow sufficient time to, be, to develop a full scope. Um, moving on to contract 15, provision of field communications. Uh, this contract was awarded to Tate Electronics and is for the provision of a digital mobile radio network for council's field-based staff that ensures reliable, safe and efficient field operations. Initial term of six years with a maximum term of 13. Council's current mobile radio network and related infrastructure and services contract was awarded to Motorola Australia in September 2007. Um, a Motorola is closing the current network which underpins this service and is no longer investing in the network, which has performance issues and is increasingly becoming undesirable. Tate Electronics head office is based in Brisbane and the infrastructure provided, provided by Tate Electronics is also Brisbane based and employs local labor. Quickly moving on to contract 16, the Arborist Advisory Services. Arborist Advisory Services, including species survey reporting investigation, analysis, advice, and remediation are used to monitor and maintain Dr. the health Allen, of the... Your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Yes. Mr. Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I missed the call earlier. Councillor Strunk's mic was dropping in and out, and then I had a sign saying my internet was unstable, so I think you all froze there for a few minutes. So, look, I'm going to speak on item C. Um, with um, the contracts that come under my portfolio. Um, the wood chippers parts and maintenance contract there, um, the particular company got this was a VPO, VPM of 62.32, which was pretty good. And this was about um, purchasing of not only some new equipment, which is um, branch and hedge chipping and tree trunk chipping machinery, but also maintenance as well on some new machinery. And it's coming forward now because there was not scheduled replacements due until this financial year, which have now come of fruition. The other contract provision of auction services for vehicles, plants and equipment. Obviously, we hire a company to do all of that when we have vehicles that require disposal at the end of their life by public auction. We have a company who had a very good VPM of 107.98 versus 76.65, which was their closest competitor. Um, and they continue to work with us to dispose of our vehicles that were no longer required. Um, and we get that income back into our budget again. The other one was the fabrication and installation of a stationary gantry elements for William Jolly Bridge. Um, this is not necessarily, as Councillor um, Cassidy suggested through you, Mr Chair, that the bridge was falling down. This is just us taking the precaution that we need to do for ongoing maintenance. So there'll be an, a, the gantry will be installed and that will, um, upon completion, will provide access for visual inspections and will act as a working platform for ongoing maintenance when required. So this is about us being proactively working and making sure that the bridge is safe and stable and our workers are able to get to it safely. Um, the contract that uh, number 16 that Councillor Adam was actually cut short on to talk about, um, that's actually got 10 local companies in there all providing different services regarding our trees. I noticed through you, Mr. Ch through you, Chair, that um, Councillor Cassidy thought that we should perhaps um, cancel all those service contracts and um, why do we not do it in-house um, as opposed to outsourcing to local businesses and workers? Well, there's actually 10 local companies that are listed there that have got contracts over $8 million and they would employ any number of local people. So the suggestion that we would then put 10 local companies and their accompanying employees out of work um, is just not one that we would contemplate. So we're happy to work with all of those different companies to provide the good service for the residents of Brisbane. And the last one is the dry hire of specialist mobile plant and quarries and asphalt plants. And this is, again, about um, the, the hiring of specialist mobile equipment and servicing repairs and maintenance. And dry hire means equipment is provided without an operator because, obviously, we have our in-house staff who operate that machinery. Um, that's it. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak to uh, items C and D. Uh, firstly, uh, to contracts and tendering, I just want to note the uh, contract for the operation and maintenance of our city cap and ferry fleet, which came through in the June uh, 2020 contracts and tendering report. Um, we all know that we are well known uh, 
uh, as the River City. We have a 22 kilometre long uh, network. We have 25 terminals stretching from the University of Queensland at St Lucia all the way to North Shore Hamilton. So this is a very uh, significant contract for our city and our uh, city cat fleet as well as our city ferry fleet play an integral uh, part of the wider public transport network. And it was great to be out uh, with the Lord Mayor this morning launching City Cat 23, uh, named after Neville Bonner, uh, Australia's first Indigenous parliamentarian. And it was fantastic to be joined by his family out there as well. Now, um, this contract uh, has come through after a, a very extensive procurement process uh, that we have undertaken. And the recommendation from the officers was to award this contract to Sealink, who will uh, trade here from November 4 this year as River City Ferries. Um, as was highlighted in the information briefing uh, offered to all councillors last month on the 1st of July, this contract extends uh, potentially as long as 15 years. The contract terms are five plus five years, with council reserving the right to extend the contract for another five years, subject to conditions being met by the operator. The procurement process undertaken by council officers was extensive with significant uh, contract, uh, the significant contracting plan coming to council in September last year and then going to the market. The pre-market engagement uh, included major public transport operators and has resulted in a uh, more innovative and robust contract for council and for ratepayers. Under the new contract, C-Link will be responsible for the employment and management of staff, the operation of all council's ferry services, the collection of public transport fares on behalf of TransLink, the scheduling of timetables and rostering of staff for all ferry services, the provision of fuel for all council ferries, and this is important because we'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but at the moment council uh, provisions for that fuel. The cleaning and maintenance of all of council's fleet and the 25 ferry terminals, ensuring council's vessels are maintained in accordance with the relevant legislation, including the federal government's uh, maritime legislation administered by AMSA or the Australian Maritime Safety Authority and providing customer information and communications, including responding to customer feedback, onboard announcements and signage. In addition, through this contract and ultimately uh, subject to council's approval, there is also the opportunity to conduct activities such as private city cap charters um, with the gross revenue to be shared with council, as well as to trial changing technologies and new ways to deliver ferry services. One of the um, innovations for C-Link is to cost and to develop and implement a new Brisbane River commentary app. So as people uh, use our city cats and go down the river, they'll be able to listen to commentary about uh, various uh, pause points and uh, city landmarks as they go past. Um, that app will provide uh, geo-based interactive mapping, audio, uh, and commentary. So that will be quite an exciting innovation that we'll be able to deliver as part of this contract. Now, it's important to note that um, the employment conditions and job security for existing ferry staff was a really important consideration for Council in its assessment of the tenders. Uh, C-Link made it very clear in their submission that the ferry staff were a priority and essential for continuity of services. This new contract obligates the operator to provide industrial stability and Sealing's proposal demonstrated a history of strong workforce management, particularly uh, during transition of contracts. And that's really important um, what we're going through this morning. Um, we were actually out on the CityCat speaking to some of the uh, ferry masters and CityCat operators this morning, uh, and they had only uh, fantastic things to say about the process that Sealing has engaged with uh, at, uh, has engaged in during this contract transition process. Um, there has been expressions of interest. There's been information briefings for staff. Um, from what we can tell, staff uh, very much feel that that transition process is well and truly underway and on track. Uh, and it's important that they feel comfortable at this time. So the new contract um, obliges, uh, sorry, I, I should say the, um, while council can't, uh, interfere in employment arrangements, C-Link committed to making every effort to offer, uh, offer employment to as many of the existing employees of uh, Transdev as possible, as well as honouring the conditions currently enjoyed by ferry staff under their enterprise agreements with Transdev. So these agreements cover not only the masters, um, but the crew and the workshop staff on shore as well. 
In evaluating the proposals, council officers conducted a comprehensive uh, set of evaluation in assessing the tenders. Non-price evaluation criteria included public transport expertise and experience, local content, uh, operations, asset management, uh, innovation and partnering, and of course, um, commercial experience as well. Price was part of the evaluation using can uh, council's standard value for money methodology. Council's commitment to supporting local businesses and delivering local benefits was a key consideration and tenderers were all requested to show the local benefits offered through their proposal. A detailed local content plan was provided by sending the demonstrated local benefits, including a local supply chain for equipment and components that almost entirely comprises the use of local businesses in Brisbane and South East Queensland, supporting and encouraging the local manufacturer of spares and sourcing of parts to develop local industry to reduce reliance on imports. A Brisbane head office, that's a big tick there. Recruitment and employment of local crew, maintenance and uh, management and support staff, and a commitment to engage at least one apprenticeship at a time to progress trainee development opportunities wherever possible. Sealink has developed a comprehensive transition uh, to work plan, including an experienced transition team to oversee and manage the transition, um, which is really key for passenger experience and the network operations. Um, I'd just like to take this moment to acknowledge uh, Sue Phillips and her uh, team for their hard work and efforts, as well as uh, Jeff Beck and his team in Transport for Brisbane uh, for all the work that was done to get uh, the contract uh, to this point uh, that we're now in a transition phase. Like the Lord Mayor, I'd like to welcome River City Ferries to the River City and I look forward to the next 10 uh, and potentially 15 years of their service on our river network. Um, now, quickly, just on item uh, D, the annual operations plan, in um, terms of the annual operational plan, the quarterly variance report, which uh, we've heard some debate on, there's a report in the 1920 financial year, including for the April to June quarter, uh, where there are some variances around the ferry contract. Um, so in um, item 1.2.1.2, provide ferry services and maintenance, there's a variance of $3.422 million. Um, and I'd just like to go into some of the reasons behind that because there's been some uh, misleading commentary around some of the root causes there. So firstly, um, this was a result of reduced fuel costs. Um, so the difference between what is estimated and what is spent each year for fuel. So we budgeted $2.3 million uh, for fuel uh, this year. We've only spent $1.7 million, leaving $600,000 unspent. And um, I heard Councillor Cassidy say before um, that there's been no real fluctuations uh, in fuel prices. Well, um, I think he should check with Councillor Cumming, Councillor Cumming, the famed uh, investor on the Labor side of the chamber, uh, because he will be able to tell you that the price of crude oil has fluctuated in the last year from a low of $37 a barrel to a high of $62 uh, a barrel. So uh, that's a pretty significant fluctuation uh, in, in my accounting, but um, I think Councillor Cashy should defer to Councillor Cumming on that. He is experienced in all, all matters of investing. Um, secondly, there's been reduced revenue for special events and charter services. And obviously, um, due to COVID, there are no charters. Uh, we budgeted uh, uh, 500,000 for that. We've spent none of that. So there's um, 500,000 unspent. Of course, then there's a return of contingency related to the tender process for the ferry contract. We build contingency into uh, to, to budget for unplanned events in relation to the contract. We had a budget of a million dollars there. Um, we didn't need that contingency. So we only spent um, 100,000 there, leaving 900,000 uh, available. So because the contract process was actually uh, quite easy uh, to move through. So I think that's a good thing. We shouldn't be wanting to spend more money on contract contingency. And then of course, reduced information materials and printing. So this is funding for uh, handing out passenger communications like for seniors off peak travel um, and other bits and pieces, items for updating of timetables. We budgeted 400,000 for that and we only spent 100,000 um, primarily because people don't want to receive uh, uh, communications uh, given to them by hand in these uh, COVID times. So uh, that's another good reason for that underspend there. Um, and then finally, uh, Transdev uh, budgeted for, <clears throat> sorry, budgeted for $4.5 million on maintenance. Are there further speakers? Councillor Howard, I think. Councillor Howard. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yes. 
Um, Chair, I entered the debate to speak to item D and particularly to the quarterly finance report. Um, in committee this morning, Councillor Cook raised questions regarding some variances in the community sport, recreation and cultural facilities service on page 46 of the quarterly financial report. The variances in the community facilities planning and development service were due to carryovers from last financial year required to align with project delivery timeframes. As we are all aware, there are a number of projects that have been impacted by COVID-19, with the pandemic not only affecting supply chains for certain materials, but also many working practices needed to be adapted as a result of the state government coronavirus restrictions. Specifically to the lines that Councillor Cook raised this morning, um, the first three that were raised were with regards to community sport, recreation and cultural facilities, community facilities, planning and development. Uh, firstly, the $350,000 variance was due to this service line receiving additional revenue from inf infrastructure charges than what was originally budgeted. Secondly, the 477,000 variance is due to a delay in the finalisation of the various contracts required for the planning and design works for the Rochdale, Windsor and Mitchelton community facilities that are being delivered as part of the local government infrastructure plan. Council continues to progress these projects and it will be great to see the future delivery of these new facilities for the local communities to enjoy for generations to come. Thirdly, Councillor Cook raised the $567,000 variance. This is due to a carryover in funding for maintenance and repairs works that were delayed due to supply chain impacts. This specifically relates to the work that Council had planned to deliver for South United Football Club, Lions Club of Inogra and Mount Gravatt Junior Rugby League. Whilst these works have been delayed, they are all underway now and due to be completed soon. And finally, the fourth line that was raised was with regards to sports and recreation facilities, community facilities, planning and development. The $219,000 variance was due to a transfer of funds between expense and capital for the synthetic sports field project, which has now been completed. This variance also accounts for the delayed investigation works for Bradbury Park, which have been impacted by the coronavirus restrictions. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak uh, on a couple of items in item C uh, to respond to issues raised earlier in the debate. I heard uh, Councillor Cassidy um, lament that there are contracts that are in entered into by council without going in into tender. Uh, but when you look at those, like the examples that you're raising, um, there are they are examples of contracts with where there are no other potential contractors. So, for example, contract 10 relates to our arrangement with TMR, Transport and Main Roads, for the provision of traffic response unit vehicles. Well, Councillor Cassidy, who else is there? <laughs> it's a contract that's entered into by council with TMR, who's the roads authority for the whole of the state. Um, it's, it's a contract that's managed by TMR and we're a party to that contract and the notes say so. Um, so you're attempting to, to uh, excite the people who are listening to this debate about council entering into contracts without going in, out to tender. Well, the example is there to show that you have either no idea or your only interest is in playing politics on these issues. The other one, um, Mr Chair, was in relation to uh, item contract 11, the Montague Road and Victoria Street upgrade, um, a contract with, guess what, the only supplier of gas services in the, the city, APA, the works uh, for a road widening. Uh, APA are the monopoly supplier of gas services in this city. Uh, who else can we enter into a contract with uh, if we have to uh, do work on their gas main as part of those road works other than the monopoly supplier? That's the circumstance. Those are those contracts that have been entered into without tender for very good reason. Um, Mr. Chair, Councillor Cassidy also found a uh, an asterisk note an asterisk note on a on a couple of items, uh, comparative prices that are, are normalised uh, for possible delay costs. Well, this is a standard contract um, that's a contract note that's entered into in these contracts, um, and for good reason. Contractors who are doing work for council. Um, 
factor in or price potential delays that may be caused by a variety of reasons, including weather or other disruptions. They're sensible to do so. Um, and they're sensible to do so because if their plant and equipment is left on site for a, a council contract, they are losing the advantage of moving that equipment on to a, another job, if, if need be, if the contract extends beyond the expected completion date, um, for good reason. That's uh, a standard clause in every contract that's entered into. So nothing to see here. Uh, this is a standard contract item. And I give thanks every Tuesday uh, that we are on this side with in responsible for the administration of contracts and tendering. And that has never, and in my time in council, hope it never becomes uh, a responsibility of the Labor Party because they clearly have no idea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Further speakers? I see no hands. So Lord Mayor's not on the screen. All right, look, I'll just move straight to a vote. Uh, items A and B, all those in favour of items A and B, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On item C, all those in favour of item C, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The eyes have it. Division. You can call by Councillor Shree and Councillor Cassidy, I think. Uh, please ring the bells. Okay, this is item C. All those in favour of item C, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no. Raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Thank you. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour, one against and five abstentions. The ayes have it. Now on item D, all those in favour of item D, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your no. hand. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths. Please ring the bells. Again, item D, all those in favour, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. 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 Thank you. And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. 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 Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour, six against, and one abstention. The ayes have it. And now on item E, all those in favour of item E, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Uh, is there a division? Will there be a division? Division called by Councillor Johnston. Division, and I appreciate a seconder. Seconder on this. Councillor Griffiths, please ring the bells. <laughs> All 
All those in favour of item E, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. 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 Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Clarks, when you're ready, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 24 in favour, one against and one abstention. Thank you. The ayes have it. That concludes the ENC report. Councillors, the City Planning Report, please. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the minutes of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 18th of August 2020, be adopted. Second that. It's been moved by uh, Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Hammond, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 18th of August 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, the Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our committee presentation last week was on Development I and the City Plan Online. So off the back of our uh, Brisbane Future Blueprint, one of our outcomes was to deliver a far more intuitive and helpful uh, PD Online. Uh, we're all very familiar with PD Online, which has been uh, going for well over a decade now, but it is getting a little bit clunky and difficult. And uh, we clearly heard from that feedback that we got um, from so many people that they'd like that to be easier. And as I said, more intuitive and easy to use. So we are implementing the system called Development I. Uh, it is something that was um, developed by the Sunshine Coast and we are buying the license from them. And there is a couple of other councils in the Southeast uh, region that will be also uh, stepping up to use Development I as well. It's map based, it is a very intuitive interface. Uh, residents will be able to get notifications based on their saved services. It really will empower residents to stay up to date with what's happening in the building and construction industry in their local area. And uh, more importantly though, to remember that the PD online will remain available um, as we wait for this basically to take over and make sure that everything's done smoothly. So we will have all of the information that has been in PD Online back to 2004, um, also put into the Development Eye process as well. And I think we will find that uh, residents and council officers, uh, council laws, I should say, and their officers will find it much easier to use as a, um, a use for looking at that. In particular, as I said, you can see superseded versions of the city plan online. You can view amendments to any um, uh, plans as they come up as well. You can make submissions. You can filter the scheme information you're looking for. Um, there's a whole lot of issues. You can view any of the code compliance documents they have as well. You can share links on the same screen through to the next segue, the city plan online homepage, which has also been updated as well. So. Again, a much easier to use panel format, predictive text searches, direct access to planning schemes and map views as well, and shortcut links then through to other council systems and web pages. So the officers have done some amazing work uh, to deliver this over the last 12 months of implementation to make sure that all of the back end is actually uh, operating as well. Hopefully all councillors have booked in a time for the team to come out and visit them within the next week or so. So their ward office um, staff and themselves can get training on how to use these two new systems because it will make everything uh, much, much easier. And if you haven't, please make sure you contact Greg Elphinson and the team so they can come out and show you um, the fantastic new systems that we'll have available as well. We also had a petition last week was about an upgrade of a telecommunications tower in Ashgrove. Uh, many councils would be aware of the running upgrades that uh, Telstra are doing at towers in their wards at the moment. And uh, they are, up, uh, are able to happen without notification or consultation under the Commonwealth Telecommunications Act 1997. So they have been given the mandate to get the job done. And the Kilawara Road one in Ashgrove that's in this petition today is an existing one that has been there for many years. Um, back as far as 1963, our records show, uh, on site in some form. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I note in this one, Councillor Toomey has gone uh, the extra mile to ask Telstra to move some of the redundant antennas to reduce the physical impact of the tower and Telstra were good enough to do so in this uh, case as well. So I will leave the debate to the chambers. Further speakers? Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Adams? Councillor Adams. Oh, there. No, I'll now put that. All those in favour of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee report, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Public and Active Transport Committee, please. Uh, Councillor Murphy, can you... Yeah, Sorry about that, Chair. Just had a bit of uh, okay. lag there. I move that the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated uh, the 18th of August 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 18th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Murphy. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Look, uh, just briefly, last week, the Public and Active Transport Committee received a presentation on Council's bikeway enhancements. So this is uh, all the things that we uh, do to our bikeways that are not actually building the bikeways themselves. So we, uh, we know that encouraging active transport is a lot more than uh, just building high quality infrastructure. So that's why Council delivers many initiatives that enhance our growing network of pathways, bikeways and river walks. Citywide, we've seen a 33% increase in cyclists and pedestrians enjoying Brisbane's bikeways and pathways for the first half of this year. Uh, Team Schrinner's delivery of new lighting, monitors, wayfinding signage, bicycle parking installations and behaviour change programs are all about encouraging and supporting this momentum that we've got. Council has a rolling program to install lighting on existing pathways and bikeways. This increases the hours of practical use of pathways, particularly through the winter months when daylight hours are shorter. Lighting projects consider environmental impacts. A range of mitigation measures uh, are available, including warmer colour lights to reduce impact on fauna, which is especially important uh, in our koala habitat areas. Recent bikeway lighting projects include the Southern Bikeway, also known as the Tarragindi Bikeway, um, the Norman Creek Bikeway. Both of these were completed this month. Um, 650 metres of lighting has been installed on the Southern Bikeway and um, when completed, the 660 metres of lighting in total will be installed on the Norman Creek Bikeway. So a great outcome. Um, in terms of um, when it comes to safety on our bikeway, sometimes it's the simplest things that can make the biggest difference. High volumes of pedestrians, cyclists and e-scooters mean that we have to be extra vigilant when we're using bikeways and footpaths. Council has installed bright new share the path markings on five popular Brisbane bikeways in response to the pedestrian and cyclist increases due to coronavirus. Wayfinding signage is a critical element of any transport system. An additional signage is planned for installation on the river loop soon. Um, when it comes to uh, banana bars, following consultation with the cycling community, um, which revealed that the bars had become conflict points on busy bikeways, Council is undertaking a rolling program of peeling back the banana bars to enhance safety. There were initially uh, 1,100 sets of banana bars in installed across Brisbane uh, throughout the 1990s, one of Labor's contributions to the cycling community. And we've heard feedback from cyclists loud and clear that Council should remove these banana bars to enhance safety. So that is exactly what we're doing. And we also have a rolling program of bicycle parking installation with 200 bicycle racks in place. In 2019-20, bicycle parking facilities were installed across 35 locations citywide. Where possible, bicycle racks have been installed adjacent to shops and services, such as council libraries, sports and recreation locations, and nearby to public transport. Council's installed 14 Greenheart bike racks across the CBD, South Brisbane and Milton, adding to the 200 bike racks already installed. Greenheart bike racks provide parking for two bikes with one locked on either side of the rack. Council also has a number of uh, counters around the city that tally people walking, cycling and using personal mobility devices on our bikeways. We have eight live bikeway monitors and have a digital number display, uh, sorry, that have a digital number display and 20 uh, non-display monitors, but they do do uh, counting. 
Locations include the Bicentennial Bikeway, Milton, the go-between bridge, South Brisbane, and the Kedron Brook Bikeway at Nunda. We also have a number of behaviour change programs that support active transport. Active School Travel provides Brisbane primary schools with the support and resources that they need to change travel behaviours. Each participating school receives support from the AST program for three years from the time that they join, and we currently have 41 schools participating in the program. Uh, we also have Cycling Brisbane, which is Council's free membership program established in 2014 to encourage people of all ages and abilities to ride a bike more often and to promote our city's bikeways. Currently, we have uh, 26,500 members, so an extraordinary amount of people signed up to Cycling Brisbane. Both programs provide the community with the information and tools that they need to influence travel behaviours, to reduce congestion and to promote bikeway infrastructure. Of course, the safety of all road users is extremely important to Council through the delivery of new bikeways, new bikeway lighting projects, boardwalk rehabilitation, mm -hmm. bikeway enhancements. This administration is improving safety and connectivity for people travelling around our city in an active and healthy way. And I will leave for the debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I uh, just wish to speak on the committee presentation, bikeway enhancements. Um, we support all the upgrades mentioned uh, in the presentation, in the report, in the presentation that was given uh, in the committee, and any upgrade to active transport infrastructure is a tick in Labor's books. What we don't support, however, is project blowouts and delays. While new lighting and more places to lock your bike up are key uh, to encouraging residents to ride instead of drive, even more crucial than that is having the physical bikeway for them to ride on chair. The suburbs um, and the CBD are riddled with dangerous stretches of road uh, that cyclists are forced to use if they want to connect between bikeways. Uh, we need to fill in these gaps. We need to build these cycle links. That should be the absolute priority. And particularly at the moment, um, there are a lot of these projects that are shovel-ready job-creating projects. That should be um, Council's priority 100%. People um, simply won't ride. This is the feedback that the administration will be receiving, as will local councillors and, and every advisory committee. People won't ride unless they're going, uh, unless they feel safe, Chair. Um, if they feel like they may get hit by a car or a truck um, or a bus, um, they won't ride. It's as simple as that. And this especially applies to new cyclists who lack um, uh, experience and confidence uh, riding uh, in traffic they will more often than not choose to stay in the comfort of their car instead of riding to work for a change. Um, if they have to share um, roads with um, very large and very fast metal objects. Uh, Labor and cycling groups have been pushing for a decent um, cycle and pedestrian grid in the city for years now. This is something that we first called for um, many years ago, one that separates cars, pedestrians and cyclists and gives each mode of transport their own lane uh, and uh, particularly this week in um, Road Safety Week, that's so important to ensure the safety of all users, car users, pedestrians uh, and cyclists. Um, the administration... I'm going to have to stop you there for a second. Um, I appreciate you making general comments about bikeways, but the, the subject of the report is actually quite specific about enhancements to bikeways and there's actually a number that are addressed inside there. So can I ask you to draw your comments back to the report, please? Yes, Chair, I was um, uh, simply talking about the enhancements that should have happened, like the pop-up bikeways that were promised in May this year. Um, we, I think, need to get more serious about um, building the infrastructure and the missing links. Um, what is talked about um, is great, um, but uh, what would be much better, uh, Chair, is to build the infrastructure that is required to make genuine mode shifts. So we see in the infrastructure um, uh, that is built and big shiny infrastructure uh, like uh, the Indrapilly Riverwalk, for instance, uh, will be a shot in the arm for cycling in that particular location, in that one particular location. And we see that when bikeway infrastructure is built, like those uh, items that are listed in the report there, Chair. But uh, until we get serious and fill in those missing links around the city, we're not going to offer people a genuine um, mode shift chair. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, the, the topics are, are quite specific and your comments are quite general. And can I ask you again to please come back to the substance of the report? That's fine. Thanks, Chair. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor Murphy. 
I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Council, is the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 18th of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Maddock. The report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 18th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor McLaughlin? Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Before I get to the items before us, I'd just like again, as I had in the last couple of weeks, to commend the State Government for its uh, current safety road safety campaign known as Street Smarts, and in particular as this is uh, Road Safety Week in Queensland. Um, the campaign uh, strikes a chord with what we are trying to do here on in council. It tackles uh, a variety of, of poor driver behaviours, uh, the risks associated with speeding, driver distraction, mobile phone use, drink driving, drug driving, seatbelt use and driving whilst tired. So uh, it goes to the issues that we at the end of the day, quite often have to deal with with speeding. I, I note also the uh, Queensland Police Service in the media this week ahead of uh, Road Safety Week uh, lamenting the increase uh, in the road toll and calling on the public to assist them in coming up with slogans or campaigns that might assist in this because there are, are, quite, op there are quite clearly issues with poor driver behaviour that is uh, contributing significantly to the road toll. And part of that cam campaign is to highlight the fact that even travelling five kilometres above the, uh, the speed limit is enough to, to double the risk of casualty crashes. Um, and uh, a stat which is worrying that 48% uh, of Queensland drivers speed on more than half of their road trips. Um, Mr Chair, that does go to the, one of the issues that we've been dealing with in the committee, the Infrastructure Committee, over the, the past few weeks. Uh, our speed limit review was the issue that we uh, went to last week as we've been looking at the, uh, or going into a deeper dive into parts of the uh, state government's manual of uniform traffic control devices. Um, and we had a, a comprehensive presentation on the process for uh, changing speed limits on our roads. Um, as was pointed out um, by the presenter, speed limit reviews are uh, an eight step process. And uh, it, it sounds cumbersome, but that's the process that's mandated. Uh, for uh, the provision of engineering services to uh, include uh, and to be initiated to be initiated on the basis of reasons including traffic behaviour, surrounding land use, safety concerns, road upgrades, and general community feedback before there can be a change to a posted speed limit. So um, this was what we we talked about in the committee um, and highlighted in the in the presentation. There are two aspects of a speed limit that are assessed. Um, crash risk, infrastructure risk, and the road classification, um, and the analysis of speed data to determine what motorists perceive as a reasonable travel speed. Um, an engineer will then overlay a professional judgment and consider other factors such as the adjust, uh, adjacent speed limits on adjoining roads, the length that a speed zone will have, uh, routes that are cons uh, consistent, and route consistency and other safety measures. So. Uh, Mr Chair, um, this information is available to all members of council. If you'd like to have a look at the committee, I, I recommend it for everyone to have a look at. Um, I think uh, the, the bottom line is that we are um, always concerned about road safety and particularly the speed on our roads. But I, I need to continue to point out that there's a process that is gone through for any changes to speed limits and it is governed and controlled by the state government's manual of uniform traffic control devices. Uh, Mr Chair, there was a, a petition uh, last week um, in relation to uh, the perceived risk of road safety in and around Urumqilly Green, and I'll uh, leave it at that point to any debate from other councillors. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on the uh, petition response um, on the uh, Yurong Pili Green. Um, I'd like to start by uh, putting on the record my views to council um, so they are very clear. Um, this, is, this is what I have written in my formal submission back to council about the petition. It's been almost one year since this petition was lodged with council about what is 
now a council road and has been for some time. The failure to act on the petitioner's response after an extensive investigation period is unacceptable. Promises were also made back in 2014 following the last petition to enhance pedestrian facilities outside the tennis centre, which have never eventuated. In January 2020, the Lord Mayor promised in writing to a resident to undertake a traffic survey and a speed review in the precinct. Was that done? If not, why not? Is Council in the habit of ignoring the Lord Mayor's commitments to residents? Why is Council now in mid-July promising to do another speed review if one was done in January? What were those results? Why aren't they part of this response? Council has had over a year to investigate responses to the petitioner's request and is still failing to act. Council agreed to upgrade the King Arthur uh, agreed to upgrade King Arthur Terrace to a district access road against my advice. Council fully supported and fast tracked the state government's master plan, road arrangements, development approvals, and neighbourhood plan for the Urolog Pilly Green precinct against my objections. Blaming the state Labor government for something council has fully supported for many, many years is counterproductive. Residents want action, not blame. And then it goes on to say, make sure you get my reply right so Councillor McLaughlin can publicly attack me as usual for what is a failure of council to act on serious road issues raised by many years for tennis and residents. Let me be clear. Um, this petition was lodged a year ago and council has done nothing in a year, not even a traffic survey promised by the Lord Mayor because I've also done a file request and I know that that's not been done. And, in fact, the black tube counters are out on King Arthur Terrace uh, now. Um, this has been a problem since day one. I went back and had a look at just some of the correspondence. As back as far as March 2009, I was asking for the shared pedestrian zone um, outside the tennis centre. Council said no. I've moved uh, motions in this chamber uh, to have shared pedestrian zones created in 2015. This council has done nothing to address the serious uh, traffic concerns on King Arthur Terrace. A couple of years ago, they refused to lower the speed on King Arthur Terrace to 50 kilometres an hour. Um, the residents are angry. I was at a big um, public meeting on Thursday night they are furious with this council for failing to act on road safety concerns. Now, let me get a couple of other things right about council's response here. Um, council is going to do a speed review. whoop de doo You could have done that a year ago when the residents asked and you did not do so. Um, council has fully supported fully supported every single thing the state government has done here and trying to blame them for not doing the right thing and fixing the problems, which you should have done at the time, is unacceptable. The neighbourhood plan that was endorsed by this council a few years ago had no public consultation. I'm the only one that voted against it along with Councillor Shree um, and we voted against it. It's the only neighbourhood plan that has had never had any consultation. Council accepted the state government's master plan, including all the road um, issues, and said, yep, we'll just endorse it. The response here is to take away a zebra crossing and refuse to put in a new zebra crossing where the residents want it. The crossing that's being taken away is the crossing that council forced on the state government, because I've seen the files. It is unacceptable what you are doing. The whole section should be 50, all of it. And there's a section around the shared area um, outside the tennis centre that should be converted to a slow shared zone like outside Griffith University at South Bank. Someone will be killed here. It is a massive area. Um, it, it, this, this development is going to be the size of a new suburb and council has not got the road safety arrangements properly in place. This response is inadequate. It does nothing practical to address the petitioner's concerns. It is the wrong response. And after a year of waiting, this is the best that council come up with. I just think it is absolutely appalling. It shows a level of inaction and neglect by this council that is unacceptable. Um, it is just not right 
that this council refuses to act on the concerns of residents. Um, the response before us today says that this, the response we're going to send out to them um, uh, will respond to the petitioner's concerns. I can tell you that it does not. I've spoken to the chief petitioner um, about the uh, response by council. He's unhappy, I'm unhappy, and the residents aren't getting any improvements. It is unacceptable that council continues to ignore road safety issues when they are raised by residents legitimately. Um, and it is, you know, uh, the promises happened in 2015, the promises happened in 2012, the promises happened in 2009. And the only thing this council has done is back the state government's overdevelopment of this complex and put lives at risk. This council needs to act now. 175 residents signed a petition. Um, it's only a few years ago that we had hundreds that signed the petition asking for the old section of King Arthur Terrace to be reduced to 50. It's just not acceptable that council refuses to act on residents' concerns. I'm, I'm so disappointed, so disappointed that council has done nothing and I had a call from the um, divisional manager, uh, oh, sorry, not the divisional manager, but the manager of uh, TNO last week asking me how things were going. And I told her exactly this. You're not doing anything. You are letting Brisbane residents down. We have hundreds of residents living in high-rise apartments immediately on a district access road without safe crossing points. The speed of through traffic is too high. It needs to be reduced down. And we need to be planning properly for pedestrian and bike access around this precinct. None of that is happening. And the only thing this administration is interested in doing is playing a pathetic and juvenile blame game with the state government. And, and that's ridiculous because council actively pursued and requested a number of the actual road treatments that are in place. For example, the zebra crossing. Council actively supported and endorsed um, the arrangements for the precinct through its neighbourhood planning process. These things um, do not demonstrate that council is willing to take responsibility and ensure that the right things are being done in this area. Let me be clear, we need safer pedestrian options. We need to reduce the speed along this section of the road. Um, and we need to make sure that pedestrians and cyclists have safe access and crossing points in an incredibly busy um, major sporting facility. And they just do not have them. And this problem is only going to get a lot worse when another 3,000 people move into a seven hectare area. It just is going to be diabolical. And I urge council to fix the problems, not just say we'll do a review and then do nothing because that's gone on now for over a decade. We need action. If someone is hurt here, council is fully aware of all of the concerns um, about this precinct. And it is incredibly disappointing um, that this council refuses to take action. Um, so I'll just say um, to the residents out there, I'm sorry that your council is not listening to you. I am sorry that we have for over a decade now asked for pedestrian safety changes and improvements as this site has developed. Um, and certainly it is clear that this council is not prepared to take responsibility for its road network. This is a council road and has been for over a year um, and it is just not good enough. It is just not good enough. And I, I, you should be ashamed. You should be ashamed to send this response out to residents who've waited a year for such a pathetic response. I do not support what you are doing. I will be calling for di a division and I flag that I would like a seconder. I absolutely am not voting for such a pathetic yes. response You're that does not respond to residents. Any further speakers? Uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I'll keep it brief. Just in response to the um, item on speed limit review processes, I, I think one thing that the report sort of omits is the level of discretion that individual council officers and engineers have 
and are able to exercise when making some of these calls. And I don't disagree with Councillor McLaughlin that ultimately this is a state government process that sets out the steps council has to follow. But particularly at the early stages in terms of um, looking at whether a particular road corridor might meet one of the criteria-based speed limit um, uh, options, there's, there's a lot of discretion that individual council officers can exercise. And I have noticed that depending on which traffic engineer in council you ask or put the request yep. through, you can get very, very different responses. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that council officers are exercising discretion in that way and that all councillors understand that although this process has the appearance of objectivity, it is in fact quite a subjective and somewhat inconsistent process. And so I, I do think it's important that particularly senior, senior council officers and department heads are aware that there's a lot of inconsistency in terms of how TPO and, and council officers within the hierarchy actually um, engage with this these processes. And certainly I've had times when I've, I've been asking for a couple of years for a speed limit review process on a particular corridor and feeling like the officers aren't even interested in it. And then there's a change of officer and I put the request through again point and get a very different again. answer. A point of order to you, uh, Councillor Adams. This again is a debate on a process, not what we have before us today. Relevance, please. Yeah, no, I appreciate, yeah, yes, thank you, um, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I appreciate the points you're making, Councillor Shree, but uh, they are, once again, something we were discussing earlier, the general comments about the general process, but this presentation is about a specific process. And can I just... <laughs> Th thanks, Chair. I, I strongly disagree with your your point. I, I'm speaking specifically about the speed limit review point process. Point of order. Um, it's definitely relevant. Point of order uh, to you. To, there was a point of order called. Who was that? Yeah, Mr Chairman, I'd just like to clarify um, the issue here. Uh, I was understanding Councillor Shree was speaking about the speed limit review process, which yes. involves the actions of council officers in assessing changes to speed limits. Are you saying that's irrelevant to the committee presentation on speed limit reviews? No, I'm not. Councillor right. Shree. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I didn't have much more to add other than that I just do want council officers and councillors and particularly the Lord Mayor to understand and be aware that there is a lot of discretion being exercised around this stuff. Um, and, and that's important because the mayor, for example, or one of the chairs might refer a question back down to the council officers and ask for their feedback and say, well, we need to draft a mail response to this question. Um, depending on which traffic engineer looks at the road in question, you can get very different outcomes and results. Uh, certainly in my ward, I advocate strongly for pedestrian safety and cycling safety outcomes and, and argue strongly for much lower speed limits. Um, and I, I wish the administration in general was more supportive of uh, being a little bit ambitious and, and enacting some of the trials, which the MUTC, the, uh, that Councillor McLaughlin referred to, does, does allow a bit of scope for trials and non-standard speed limits, depending on specific circumstances. But either way, my point really in response to this report is that while it has the veneer of an object, objective and neutral process, uh, there's a lot of wiggle room and a lot of scope for discretion in there. And um, the, the council administration needs to acknowledge that and grapple with that. And in particular, um, when the infrastructure chairs team is working closely with the public and active transport chair team, it's really important to be mindful of that because sometimes, for example, the bikeways guys or um, council officers who are looking at pedestrian safety might have a view that dropping the speed limit makes sense. Uh, but if the traffic engineer that they happen to be talking to doesn't want to lower speed limits, then it won't go any further than that. So it is important that we're really mindful of that and that we look to um, be guided a little more strongly by those concerns of about pedestrian safety and by the, the views of local councils, I think, because at the end of the day, if someone is exercising discretion, you would think that that discretion, exercise of discretion needs to be accountable in some way and, and it needs to be clear and transparent as to why a certain officer is making a certain decision rather than um, pretending that it's a neutral or objective 
inquiry when in fact that, that there's quite a bit of power that's being exercised behind the scenes. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I'll be brief in wrapping up. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Sree's remarks about his claim, if anyone was listening to that, uh, though you may conclude that uh, in his opinion and therefore conclude that uh, council officers have the discretion to make these decisions about speeds on roads. Uh, they can have an opinion, but it's extra, it's, it, the process is, as was outlined in the committee report, it goes to a speed management committee that consists of council, Queensland Police Service, and the state government's transport department of transport and main roads. So uh, whilst there may be an opinion of a, of a council officer, it is a, a committee response and it is a response made up of everybody who's involved in road safety, starting with the police department, transport and main roads and council. So uh, if anybody's listening and believe as a consequence of listening to Councillor Three, that council officers can manipulate the outcome of that process of a request from a councillor to have a, a reduction in the speed limit. That's not correct. Uh, it does go through the process. It is outlined in the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, and it is mandated by the state government, um, and, uh, and it is under the control of the state minister for transport. Um, Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Claim to be misrepresented. Well, I don't think you were, but all right, I'll note it. Councillor McLaughlin, can you tell me? Point um, of order, Chair. Point of order to you. I, I, I'm just seeking a ruling as to whether you're able to express an opinion as to my claim to be misrepresented before I've even explained the claim. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, sorry, I think we had a slight freeze there. Um, in relation to Councillor Johnson's remarks, well, look, you know, Councillor Johnson uh, loves process until the process delivers an outcome she doesn't agree with. Um, this, this is a road network, as she mentioned, uh, has come to Council as a contributed asset from Economic Development Queensland, EDQ, who are responsible for the development of the area to which she refers, Yering Pilly Green. There are issues with the road network that have been inherited, and I'm happy to look at those issues that we've inherited. Uh, they do include, for example, uh, the installation of a, a, a zebra crossing on a road that has a 60 kilometre an hour road speed. Um, and that is against and contrary to Council the, asked the, for the zebra crossing. control devices. Council so uh, asked that's an issue for... that we will, we will attend to as we look at the issue as we for... maintain this road network. Now it is council mm -hmm. control. Don't blame them. You asked. All right. Councillor Shreed, you claim to be misrepresented. Yeah, Councillor McLaughlin suggested that I was claiming that council officers are manipulating the process. That's certainly not what I was saying. I was simply saying that there is some discretion exercised because some of the criteria are qualitative rather than quantitative. Thank you, Councillor Shreed. All right, I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Those against, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Councillor, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Report, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 18th of August 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Davis that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 18th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. Our presentation last week was an update on Council's street trees. Our city supports more than 450,000 urban street trees and millions of trees in our urban parks. Brisbane street trees provide a broad range of values and functions with benefits including economic, such as increased property values and reduced energy costs, environmental, such as wildlife habitat, reduced stormwater flows, reduced water pollution, reduced air pollution and stored carbon, and social and cultural values, such as providing shade and cooling, creating attractive landscapes, and improved sense of space, and encouraging outdoor activity. As lovely as our trees are, there are some challenges to maintain the health of urban street trees, and these include tree diseases and pests like funguses and borers, weather events, increasingly contested space in our suburbs and adjacent residents refusing to support new street trees being planted. We've undertaken an inventory of all street trees and have recorded more than 500 species and their relevant height, canopy width and age class. 
Following on from the citywide street tree audit, council officers have also undertaken a review of the 36 approved tree species for streets in Brisbane City. The review selected tree species with the following characteristics, good performing, low maintenance needs, climate resilience, small to medium size, ability to grow under power lines and enhancing a sense of place within each precinct. The review has seen nine of the current species retired with the new list containing 64 approved street tree species. We're also working with Energex to find approved trees that can be planted under power lines. Currently, there is only a list of six. During the review, an additional seven were identified and the list is currently sitting with Energex for approval. We also had two petitions in our committee last week. First petition was requesting that council install a gazebo and seating in Eleanora Park at Wynnum, dog off leash area, or consider planting more trees in that park. A shelter with seats was installed within the small dog off leash area and was completed in early July 2020. The second petition was requesting to not relocate the shelter in the dog off leash area in Mary Mary Park at Chapel Hill. Understand that the shelter was close to residents' homes when the requests were made by neighbouring homeowners. The shelter was proposed to be moved further into the park and that unfortunately has a flood overlay. So the users of the dog park and the head petitioner met with Councillor Adaman and worked out a compromise to move the shelter away from the house but not into the flood overlay area. Both local residents and dog park users seem happy with this outcome and I understand that Councillor Adaman is going to talk further about this. But I wanted to clarify as both Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths abstained from voting during the committee. I'll leave debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Yes. Sorry, who was it? Adamin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak about item C, the petition about the shelter of the Merry Merry Dog off Leash Park at Chapel Hill. I'm pleased to report that this is a story with a happy ending, but it could have easily gone the other way. This is democracy at its best and shows how Council's petition system is meant to work. It's been a win for people power. But to get the outcome, it ultimately needed Council to listen and respond. And I thank the Schriner administration for doing exactly that and acting in the best interests of those we represent. Let me start by painting a brief picture about this particular dog off leash park. Because of its location, Mary Mary is arguably the most popular dog off leash park in the Pullen Bar Ward. It's that good that even my son's very particular French uh, bulldog, Basil, loves it. It's one of those community, uh, wonderful community meeting places where locals congregate in, in numbers and make it a social occasion while their dogs do what dogs do in an off-leash park. But not everyone will ever be happy. Enter a local resident who lives close to the park who uh, I'll call or refer to as X. Despite the fact that he purchased his property after the dog park was established, it's fair to assume X doesn't like dogs, nor does it appear that he likes seeing people enjoying themselves. So X went out of his way to make life as uncomfortable as he could for the Chapel Hill dog loving community. It started with loud, heavy metal music, but when that didn't deter them, it was replaced with a different type of metal, that being the sound of a chainsaw being pumped out through an amplifier. Enter the candidate. Early into the election campaign, I was invited to attend a meeting of the disgruntled dog owners at the park. They had been told that X was pressuring council to have the dog shelter relocated to another part of the park where, when it rained ever so slightly, became a creek. As a candidate, there was nothing I could do to intervene, but I promised that if elected, we would sort this out but we needed to buy time. And the only way we could do that was to encourage people power and submit a petition to council. That the residents did and in numbers and the rest was history. Upon being elected as the Pullen Bar Ward Councillor, I contacted the chief petitioner, Rob Murdoch and told him that I would deliver on my commitment. Mr. Chair, I want to acknowledge our Western Suburbs Assets team, and in particular, Parks Manager Shane Klepper, who was fantastic in helping me achieve an outcome that the majority supported. We looked at the existing decaying shelter, and it came down to a choice of upgrading that, 
building a new one in its place or building a new one in another section of the park. I consulted the local community, but before we made a final decision, I door knocked X to let him know what we were thinking. While he conceded what we had in mind was better than where the shelter was currently located, his preference was still out of sight, out of mind in the path of the creek. The happy ending I mentioned earlier is that the dog lovers of Chapel Hill love their new shelter, which is further away from X's residence. At their invitation, I joined them one Friday afternoon recently to celebrate the end of the journey. What I didn't expect was to be ambushed by X and have a spotlight in my face and uh, some, a lot of abusive language. As local representatives, we've all been there, but the reward is achieving the right outcome and one that the community knows was made in their best interests. Mr. Chair, it goes without saying that this outcome is perfect for the dogs and the local residents are no longer up the creek. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, can you just turn your microphone on, please? Yep, it's on now. Sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the call. Um, just like to ask for seriatim for item C. Uh, just for, for voting. Voting. Yep. Yep. That's it. Um, so uh, where will I start? I'll start first week uh, first on the presentation. Last week we did have a very interesting presentation um, and yeah, I think uh, Councillor Cunningham mentioned there were 450,000 trees in the city that were found and um, that they have realised or they've found that they can fit another 100,000 um, trees or street trees into our city. So um, we welcome that. Um, I also noted um, that they could do that. They could do an analysis of street trees or a map of street trees, but they couldn't do a map of uh, broken footpaths. So that might be something the administration wants to work on, that we're good with street trees, but we fail with footpaths. Um, in relation, and each of those trees, as I understand it, is, has a GPS location, so they're very easy to track. Um, the difficulty uh, with this or some of the benefits to our street trees, as um, Councillor Cunningham said, is there's economic, environmental and social. That all makes sense to most of us. But I think what was interesting for me was what came out in the presentation was that um, wealthier suburbs have more trees and wealthier suburbs have more street trees. And... Um, Lower socioeconomic areas or poorer areas have less tree cover and less um, the less uh, money to put into street trees and other trees. So it was a very interesting divide and it seems to be one that we haven't grappled with in our city. We seem to be very good at providing street trees to people who are more affluent and not necessarily good at greening our suburbs uh, that aren't as affordable, aren't um, not looking after our citizens in areas that aren't as affordable. And I thought that was a very uh, telling indictment on the administration and very telling indictment on our city. And uh, I think it's really disappointing that we aren't actually focusing on the areas of our city that actually need street trees because they don't have enough cover but we're sort of going, we'll plant more street trees in suburbs that already have lots of street trees. Um, and one of the examples that I thought of was um, our industrial areas. Now, we've set as a goal that we're going to have 50% um, tree cover in our residential areas, but residents who live near industrial areas, what are they getting? They're actually getting zero, nothing. And there is no plan for our industrial areas and I asked in the presentation for a copy of the heat map. Strangely enough, it wasn't with the presentation, but the heat map, when you've seen this presentation several times, as I have over my time in council, consistently shows that the hottest areas of the city are our industrial areas. These are the areas we forget, we fail, we miss out on. And um, I, I wasn't surprised that it wasn't in the presentation because I think it's too telling. And I don't think it fits the story that the administration wants to tell. So from my perspective, I really um, think those heat maps belong with this presentation, belong with a plan for what we're going to do with the hottest areas of our city. And it was noted when an area is shaded, 
we actually, we make it 7% cooler. So why don't we want to shade the hottest areas of our city? Wouldn't that be something simple and effective that we can do? I think so. The party, the lab party thinks so. I, I call out to the administration to actually come up with a plan that will see street trees planted in our hottest areas. Um, so that aside, I think we should be the leader with this program. We shouldn't be just patting ourselves on the back here saying we've done a great job. There is so much more we can do. And we need to be doing that um, so that we can lead nationally, but also internationally and show what can be done with a city that looks after tree planting across the whole city and for everyone. And finally, I'll just go back to that petition that Councillor Adam was talking about. I understand that was raised by the previous councillor, Councillor Kate Richards. And I noticed that Councillor Kate Richards, well, it certainly says it in the petition, uh, wasn't, um, wasn't acknowledged. And I think that's really sad given that Kate Richards performed so well in the chamber and was so loyal to the LNP, even right to the end. Even to the end after she'd been knifed, she was loyal. And no one, no one there, even her old mate, the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor, can say her name. You know, I just think that's a sad indictment of the administration and a sad indictment on Councillor Richards, who I actually thought did a pretty good job and I thought was a pretty effective operator in her community. Um, so we won't, be, we won't be supporting... Oh, I've, I've touched a nerve somewhere. Um, we won't be supporting that petition. OK, um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I referred to the uh, petition uh, in relation to item B. Uh, the petition sought uh, shade and seating on trees or trees over the small dog off-leash area at Eleonora Park, which, has a, uh, which is a major park on the Esmart and at the northern end of Wynnum. The park includes a large dog off-leash area, one of the largest in Brisbane. It's about 200 metres long and 100 metres wide. It also includes the Wynnum Rugby Club and the Wynnum Softball Club. Uh, but a couple of years ago, in response to public demand, uh, we established a small dog off-leash area adjoining the large area. The two areas have a common fence. Uh, a nice little shelter was uh, constructed, which included some seats. It was decided that this was a better option than planting trees, which have in the past reached a certain uh, root depth and then... Uh, the trees have curled up their toes. This is because the uh, Eleonora Park is on an old dump site. Uh, I believe the seats under the shelter were made up of recycled plastic, and uh, I thought that's a good use of, uh, of plastic. Uh, and uh, I inspected the shelter several months ago, and it's well built, and uh, it appears to achieve the objectives it intended. It will be particularly appreciated during the hot summer months. And also, I should mention the uh, the project was paid for out of the Ward Suburban Enhancement Fund. I'd like to thank the council officers for uh, working with me to come up with a solution to this problem. Thank you. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. And I'd first like to address the comments from Councillor Griffiths. It is categorically untrue what he said about where our street trees are planted and he knows that it is untrue. The comment from the council officer was that community attitudes towards street trees are different. And that is reflected in research and, and we have that research to back that up. And Councillor Griffiths knows that the comment from the, from the councillor officer was around community attitudes towards street trees are different in different suburbs. It's completely untrue what he said. As he also said through you, Mr Chair, he referred to the heat map. As I explained to Councillor Griffiths, the heat map is with the state government. When I have permission to release that, I will be more than happy to share it with Councillor Griffiths. I'll leave the rest. Thanks, Mr Chair. I will now put items A and B. All those in favour of items A and B, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. On item C, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. 
Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. No one has called the division. I'll move on. The City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee, please. Councilor Thank you, Mark. Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee held on Tuesday the 18th of August 2020 be adopted. It's been moved by Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Toomey, that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 18th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Marks? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Just briefly, the committee presentation was on Habitat Brisbane Group, um, some of the wonderful work they do, and there was two petitions, which I'm happy to leave to the chamber for debate. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item A. Sorry, I was just having a bicky. Um, I am um, very happy to speak on the Habitat uh, Brisbane program and acknowledge the very hard work of the wonderful bush care groups that work in Tennyson Ward. Um, it is um, a remarkable group of people who go out sort of rain or shine to assist uh, to care for council's bushland. And I'm very lucky in Tennyson Ward um, that we have quite a lot of really active bush care groups, many of whom have been going for the whole term of the program and, um, you know, many for 20 years as well. So the, we've got some newer ones like at Yoronga, but particularly down the Oxley Creek Corridor, most of the bush care groups in my area have been very long serving bush care groups. There's two things that I want to put on the record today. Um, firstly, um, in paragraph eight, um, council chose to focus on the work of the um, Cliveden Avenue Reserve uh, bush care group, and in particular, Carol Bristow. And anybody who knows um, Brisbane City Council um, uh, and the Habitat Group will know Carol. Um, she is one of the most extraordinary volunteers. We all have them in our ward. Um, she not only leads this bush care group, she works on pretty much all the other bush care groups as well. And I had the privilege of seeing her on Friday afternoon at a um, another community event and letting her know uh, that we'd been talking about her in council. So it's great to see her um, recognised and the hard work of the team she works with uh, being recognised as well. Um, I want to just say, though, that it's disappointing that council has not supported this group in the way that they have requested. And I raised this matter in committee last week and I emailed Councillor Marks about it uh, last week as well. Um, one of the bush carers was hurt um, in a boggy section of track. Uh, in this area, and both uh, Carol and another one of the bush carers have been requesting council to undertake some repairs um, on this section of the track. And um, despite repeated requests, council has failed to do so. I was hoping that Councillor Marks would address that issue um, in her opening remarks uh, tonight in this matter. Um, these are volunteers who do a wonderful job for us, and they've asked for some minor repairs to an area um, you know, that would make it a lot easier for them to work in and would also have enormous public benefit because there is a walking track in this area. So I hope that Councillor Marks will address this issue uh, when she sums up today because, um, you know, they don't often ask for things, um, but they have certainly asked uh, for action uh, on this uh, problem section of the track in the uh, reserve they work in. Um, and I... I really don't think it is unreasonable that we um, that we take action to support them and provide a safe working environment for them, as well as improve um, public facilities. And the fact that multiple requests have been denied, um, I think, makes a mockery of the fact that that this council wants to celebrate their work but won't support them when they ask for things to be done uh, to make it that little bit easier and safer for them uh, to work. So I just. Uh, say that that information was sent to Councillor Marks last week. I certainly hope that I'm going to get a reply and uh, certainly I'd hope she'd confirm today that um, uh, that this section of the track uh, will, will have some repairs. 
presumably it's a fairly simple fix. The second issue, which again should not have been a difficult one, um, uh, was that our bush care officer for South Region, Julia Bloomhart, has uh, stepped down. Um, and I received a request, it was really interesting timing, just a few days before the um, petition, I received, a, sorry, the uh, presentation to committee. Um, I received a request uh, from the uh, three bush care groups, um, the Clarkton Avenue Bush Care Group, the Nosworthy Park Bush Care Group, or oh, actually four, Nosworthy Park Bush Care Group, the uh, Kendall and Lawson Street Bush Care Group, and then um, Noel's chimed in from the Bonarawa uh, Bush Care Group, asking me to place on the record um, their thanks to Julia for her assistance um, with bush care activities over the past um, you know, few months while she'd been leading a specific project for them. I was very happy to do that and I asked that um, that be recorded in the minutes. Um, unfortunately, that did not occur um, and I feel quite disappointed again that we had to have an argument about it in committee this morning to ensure that the hard work of a council officer um, requested by the bush care groups was acknowledged. So, Mr Chairman, uh, through you to Julia and all the bush carers out there, it's my um, great pleasure to let you know that, that the bush care groups, the volunteers who work with you, are so very thankful for your support. Um, they acknowledge and respect the work that you are doing um, and uh, they particularly wanted me to place on the record their thanks uh, to Julia for her hard work um, over the past uh, months for supporting their work along the Oxley Creek Corridor. Uh, we do have a new bush care uh, coordinator coming on for our region and certainly I'm sure the groups look forward to working with him. Uh, but to Julia, um, the groups, uh, thank you very much. And um, certainly I would like to see that reflected, um, you know, when we make requests on behalf of these groups. It, it, it doesn't sit well with me that council wants to use them for its own purposes but then won't support them when they make requests and that's something that needs to be corrected. So a big thank you to the um, Kendall at, and Lawson Street Bush Care Group, the Nosworthy Park Bush Care Group, uh, the Bonarawa Bush Care Group and the Clifton Avenue Bush Care Group, all of whom are passing on their thanks uh, to Julia uh, for her hard work in assisting them. Further speakers? Further speakers? Yes. Oh, Councillor Adams, excuse me. Thank you, Mr Chair. I just want to speak briefly on item B. Um, this is one of those tricky petitions where obviously there's some very large trees that are causing enormous damage to a building, a, a brick apartment building, uh, but they are enormous large trees. So they are extremely important to the biodiversity of the local area in Mount Cravat here, Mount Cravat East. Um, but I thank the council officers who will be working with the residents to talk about the options they have to minimise the impact of the roots of those trees. Uh, so hopefully we can get an outcome for uh, the trees to stay and be there as important biodiversity they are, but the uh, residents and the body corporate be able to deal with the roots and the issues that they have. Further speakers? Councillor Marks. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I just want to wrap up briefly. Can I just um, make mention of the email that was um, mentioned to me from the Council for the Tennyson Ward through you, Mr Chair? Um, the email was sent last week, yes, but Friday, the 21st at 12.25. I got it on my desk on Monday at 24th of August at 4.11pm. So yesterday afternoon was when it was brought to my attention that there was an issue. The email says that they're getting more information about uh, the bush care getting so hurt. Your, your attention. Mm -hmm. We're not aware. Can can I can I just reiterate, Councillor, uh, through you, Mr Chair, that the email here is dated Friday the 21st of August at 12.25 from the Tennyson Ward. for CC to Tom McHugh in Brisbane... Um, area. So as I was saying that the email is now at my attention, which is on Tuesday afternoon, five minutes before we go to Chambers, 
and I am seeking information on that um, email request. And I, as I was going to say, we we're getting more information about the bush carer getting hurt because my understanding is that no one was aware of the particular incident. So I'm waiting to hear back more information on that. And once that comes to hand, I will seek to send a answering email to Councillor Johnson through you, Mr Chair, as I do all the councillors' response that are requested from me. Thank you. I'll now put the, I'll now put the item. All those in favour of the report, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors. The uh, Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I move that the report of the meeting of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee held on the 18th of August be adopted. Second. Moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers, the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting, excuse me, dated Tuesday, the 18th of August 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. We had a, just very briefly, we had a presentation from the Manager of Inclusive Communities um, in, in about their response to COVID-19 last, uh, last week. Connected communities have done an incredible amount of work supporting our communities throughout the pandemic. And I do want to take this opportunity to thank them for their tireless hard work and their dedication to Brisbane. There is so much work that goes on behind the scenes to support our community organisations. As soon as the pandemic hit, our council officers went straight to the phones, contacting more than the 400 community organisations and clubs to find out how we could support them through the pandemic. Our teams were also hard at work supporting our vulnerable residents, moving quickly to adapt services immediately. Uh, we changed... Uh, Changes to council cabs were made to ensure isolated residents could access local shops and essential services. So, uh, Chair, these are just a couple of examples of their amazing work through the pandemic. So, again, I'd like to say thank you to our wonderful Connected Communities team for all their hard work and dedication to supporting our communities and community organisations through this very difficult time. It's been heartwarming to hear of the impacts you have had on our local residents and communities. The lovely cards and letters that residents have sent in demonstrate just how impactful your work is and that makes it such an important difference to supporting our residents and communities. And on that note, uh, Chair, I commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? I see none. Councillor Howard? No, that's it. I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee, please. Councillor Allen. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 18th of August, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Huanga. The report of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 18th of August, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Allen. Uh, Mr Chair, but, <coughs> sorry, before moving to the um, committee presentation, um, I did want to just touch upon a couple of items that um, uh, Councillor um, Cassidy and Strunk raised earlier. I didn't get to all the contracts that uh, Councillor Cassidy was seeking uh, feedback on, but I did want to take the opportunity just to highlight to him why we may not go for a competitive tender in various instances. So <clears throat> one of the reasons might be there's a specialist provider um, there may be no other alternative. You might be locked into a provider. As uh, Councillor McLaughlin said, one of his contracts, he had to deal with TMR. Um, it may also be that we have something that's um, compatible with another council solution. So it makes sense to uh, use a particular provider without a competitive tender. We might have an early or unexpected termination of a contract that needs to be quickly replaced. So we go to market and find a, an alternative. Um, it may be that we've got existing or previous relationships with a particular provider. Um, we also look to uh, leverage the state government purchasing arrangements where we can. So that might also influence how we go about securing a tender. And also it may be an interim arrangement where we're seeking to um, extend a tender for a short period of time, pending a more um, sophisticated solution. So there's a number of reasons why 
we wouldn't go to a competitive tender. Um, Councillor Strunk, you raised some questions about the um, uh, the annual report. What I'll do, the, the response is a little bit long and rather than read it out here, I will email that to you if that's okay. Um, in terms of the, um, the committee presentation, we had a, a committee presentation on the seven day um, small business payment program, which the Lord Mayor introduced. And just to give you some really high level numbers, um, we've got uh, something of the order of $295 million uh, in the period from April to July, um, of which there were 50,436 invoices to 2,477 suppliers. So certainly it's a great way of putting cash back into the, the pocket of our, our suppliers. I won't go into a further detail on the presentation. Um, there was a committee report on bank investments, uh, the bank and investments report for June 2020, and I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Allen? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Thank you. And those who say no and raise your hand, the ayes have it. Councillors, that concludes the consideration of committee reports. I draw to your attention the notified motion. Councillor Johnston, please move the notified motion. Uh, yes, I move that Brisbane City Council initiates amendments to City Plan 2014 to remove provisions that allow rooming accommodation and boarding houses within the low density and character residential zones of City Plan 2014. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Johnston and seconded by Councillor Shree. The notified motion has written inside the agendas provided to all councillors. Uh, Councillor Johnston, to the motion, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, look, I've put this uh, motion on the agenda today um, because there's a clear failure when it comes to Council's DA uh, approvals process and the compliance and enforcement process uh, that is being taken advantage of by uh, some developers in my ward that I am aware of. And I want to outline um, the significance of the problem um, and why uh, I believe we need to take steps to address uh, the problems within city plan. Um, currently, um, rooming accommodation, as it is known in city plan, is either accepted development or, in some small instances, code accessible development. In most cases, no DA actually comes to council for what are boarding houses in low density and character residential areas. The problem with what is happening is uh, developers are actually building de facto units. Uh, I have several examples in Tennyson Ward, including in Lancelot Street, Tennyson, in uh, Vivian Street, Tennyson, and in Park Road in Yurongpilly. Uh, in my view, the developers are doing an end run around the city planning provisions uh, with respect to uh, rooming accommodation. And to give you an example, uh, each of the apartments being built in these locations contains a kitchen. Uh, it contains its own bathroom uh, as well as a bedroom. And uh, yes, there is also a communal living space um, but essentially, uh, each of these areas has um, a room uh, which has been built to be self-contained, including, as I said, a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, these are going; uh, these de facto units are going into areas where there are character residential, uh, very low density kind of areas. So suddenly, residents are coping with um, five units on subdivided land. Now in Park Road, for example, where there was one house, beautiful character house, big house, um, uh, council has allowed a subdivision into three small lot blocks and now wants to put uh, five rooming accommodation, uh, sorry, three rooming accommodations, each containing five apartments. So 15 units on what was previously one block. That's unacceptable to the residents out there. Um, the developer has worked out that he um, only has to apply uh, because it's in the character uh, area of, um, sorry, has to apply to council for code assessment because it's in the character area. In Tennyson, the developers do not require uh, 
even require council approval. Now, I've raised this issue with cars as well. So we're dealing with it through the planning scheme, which unfortunately is too permissive. Um, it needs to be addressed so that developers aren't building de facto units. Uh, and that is hugely problematic. I've also addressed the issue with cars. So once the building's complete, we then have evidence of uh, developers doing the wrong thing. And you can go on realestate.com right now um, and just Google Tennyson and you will find uh, 58 and 60 Lancelot Street, Tennyson, uh, one uh, bedroom, one bathroom, two car space studio, $300 a week. And I'll read you the description of how it's being advertised. Brand new studio apartments all with parking spaces. Located in the green leafy suburb of Tennyson are these brand new furnished studio apartments, meticulously designed and ready for immediate occupation. Here's the one at Vivian Street. Uh, 70 Vivian Street, Tennyson, one bedroom, one bathroom, one car park unit, $290 a week. Uh, fully self-contained studio, all bills included. This newly built property contains five fully self-contained apartments. Now, the developer uh, is not allowed to advertise these properties as apartment. That is, as cars have told me, an unauthorised use. We have, for the best part of this year, been pushing cars to take action. Um, they say that despite publicly advertising these properties as de facto multi-unit dwellings, that they cannot take action. Um, we have, unfortunately, one of the five areas where a resident moved in and allowed council to investigate. So a show cause notice has been issued for one of the apartments where there are 10 apartments. Um, we can't do this in dribs and drabs. Uh, we can't have apartments being built in low density and character residential areas. And that is what is happening. There is clear evidence available online that that is how they're being advertised. They've been built. So they obviously look like apartments. In Tennyson, um, the downstairs area is complete undercroft, all with car parking. So five units upstairs, 10 car parks downstairs. It's not a house. It doesn't look like a house. It looks like um, a complex of apartments. It is so disappointing that council has not acted on a compliance basis. Now, I understand the need for um, affordable housing and public housing. Um, I live in a street. My neighbours across the road um, absolutely uh, live in public housing. It's so important that we have it in the right areas. The problem with this is these are commercial developers who may then exploit vulnerable, uh, vulnerable people by advertising uh, in a particular way. That is not acceptable. We either need affordable, develop, affordable housing solutions designed appropriately in supported areas uh, and not, not uh, this type of scheme, which is a for-profit scheme that could take advantage of vulnerable people. Equally, we need more public housing. There is no question about that. There is a huge waiting list. So this is not about stopping affordable housing solutions. This is about making sure that de facto unit blocks are not being built in low density areas um, and in character residential areas. And unfortunately, um, that is what is happening. I also don't want to hear from the LNP about any blame game with the state Labor government. Um, we have an obligation under city plan to take action. Um, and I certainly, uh, I certainly want to see uh, this council take the right steps to um, remove this process uh, from the low density and character residential area. If developers want to build units, they should build them in areas appropriately zoned, like low to medium density, medium density or high density. Um, units are not appropriate in low density areas. Um, equally, I would say that from a development assessment point of view, um, when we as a community raise the fact that something called rooming accommodation has a private bathroom and a private kitchen in every unit, it's clearly a unit. It is not um, a share house. I pretty much I reckon all of us lived in a share house at one uh, time or another when we were at university and we all shared a bathroom, we shared a kitchen. 
I think we all have a concept of what a share house is or what rooming accommodation is. Um, but the design that is creeping in uh, to the planning scheme in suburbs in my ward is de facto units. And in my view, that needs to stop. Um, I'd certainly urge all councillors to vote for this um, motion because we need to put in place um, the proper steps to investigate what changes need to be made to city plan to prevent this type of um, unauthorised uh, development happening in future. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I rise to speak on the motion before us and explain why the administration won't be supporting this motion here today. Um, Councillor Johnson doesn't want to hear the blame game through you, Mr Chair. And last week, she didn't even want to hear the democracy of the people of Brisbane because this motion originally came through to just abolish it. Don't worry about speaking to the residents. Don't worry about speaking to the community. It's all about democracy until Councillor Johnson wants something done instantly. Straight out abolish it. Well, that's not how we operate in this administration. And only two years ago, we went out and approached every single resident in Brisbane and asked them how they wanted to see this city shaped. 100,000 people came back with 15,000 unique ideas from every suburb in Brisbane. And they told us loud and clear what they wanted from us. And that resulted in Brisbane's future blueprint. And we heard them and we made those moves to make the amendments that they wanted to see. Townhouses in low density residential was a major issue for residents, so we removed that uh, provision. Residents wanted to see increased deep planting ratios. That's been delivered. Car parking ratios needed fixing. We've since fixed that. But one thing that didn't come up in that was a major concern about residents and rooming accommodation. Now, I have to say I accept that there are some incidences where residents are now recognising issues in their streets but this does not have the marks of a major citywide issue at this point of time that immediately needs addressing. Admittedly, I've only been the chair for five months in city planning and economic development, but I've received no letters or emails from Councillor Johnson or Councillor Shree on this issue. Um, there is no plethora of supporting evidence um, through my office to support this motion at this time. I know Councillor Johnson did contact the Lord Mayor in April, but apart from that, nothing. So for council to make a substantial change to the city plan, we need to know the community widely accepts that change and uh, want to see that change as well. And what is proposed is effectively removing affordable housing provisions, which is directly inconsistent with Councillor Shree's worldview. So I'm not quite sure where why he uh, seconded this motion. Maybe it's under the philosophy, Councillor Shree, through you, Mr Chair, that democracy, so we can have the debate and have the discussion around it. Uh, but for that reason, I would like to move an amendment to this motion. I move the following amendments, and I'll just send that through to the uh, Council of Support. Remove the word initiates and add in the words continues preparation of the housing strategy for Brisbane, which may lead to. Remove the words to remove the provisions that allow rooming accommodation and boarding houses within low density and character residential zones of city plan 2014 and add the words relating to various types of accommodation following public consultation. The motion will now read, Brisbane City Council continues its preparation of the housing strategy for Brisbane, which may lead to amendments to the Brisbane City Plan 2014 relating to various types of accommodation following public consultation. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order uh, to you, Councillor Johnston. Mr Chairman, um, the motion that I've put forward talks about um, initiating changes to city plan to prevent a particular type of development from occurring. Yes. Councillor Adams' amendment um, does not... Uh, it, it completely changes the motion before us today, and that's contrary to the rules of... Um, procedure and it should not be allowed it changes the intention of the motion before us thank you i've not seen this amendment i have to um i'd like to sit down before i make a decision point of order chair what just what while you're waiting for that amendment to come through thank you, 
Yeah, I, I just want to echo what Councillor Johnston has said. This proposed amendment fundamentally and dramatically changes the original motion and I think is is so very different that it, it, it constitutes an entirely new motion. Yeah, I think it, it, can't, an entirely new motion. it can't can't reasonably be categorised as an amendment. I understand the argument. I need, uh, please allow me a moment to consider it. Like I say, I've not seen it. This is the first time I'm reading it now. Well, I haven't seen it either. Is it being sent? I have said that, Mr. Yes. Chair, if Chloe received it. Uh, yeah, they have, and they are now forwarding it to uh, forwarding it to uh, the meeting. Uh, councillors, may I, I appreciate the hour, but may I please have a resolution for a 10 minute uh, adjournment so that I can discuss this with the uh, city legal officer. Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn for 10 minutes for you to uh, get advice from Brisbane City Legal on whether the amended motion is suitable. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Hammond. Moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Hammond. A brief, uh, uh, it'll only be a brief um, moment to allow me to discuss this with the city legal officer. 10 minutes. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you. And those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors.
Thank you for your patience, councillors. I've uh, spoken to City Legal Officer uh, and he is of the view uh, and uh, that using section 41A that the amendment proposed is too different from the original motion for it to retain the identity. Um, I have also spoke to him about uh, item 41.7, about speakers who move amendment motions that are lost. In this instance, this amendment motion um, has been ruled uh, invalid by 41A and therefore um, the, it is not lost and I'll return to Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so what we have before us today is a motion that uh, we have already got in train the works that need to be done to have proper consultation around housing and accommodation. This affects all residents. As a growing city with increasingly diverse and connected community, there are a range of emerging trends and we know with disruption, as we spoke about last week, that short-term accommodation, rooming accommodations, all of these are reshaping the way we live but at different stages of our life and different houses that we're choosing, we need to make sure that we cater for everybody as well. On top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic has completely disrupted our everyday life and has significant impact on our city's economy. So we're really only just beginning to understand how that actually affects supply and housing as well. We need to manage the city, and which is home to one in four Queenslanders, and we need to make sure that, of course, we meet the state government's dwelling target of 188,000 dwellings to be delivered by 2041. So to respond to the immediate needs of re um, residents, we do need to balance the larger growth patterns across the city, not just ad hoc change it when it doesn't suit Councillor Johnson at a particular time and point of time. It's a conversation we need to have with the community, which is where the amendment motion was going, that uh, councillors would be aware that we've had the conversation with the community, as I mentioned, off the back of Plan Your Brisbane, where 100,000 people had their say, we put forward amendments that we have already moved based on the feedback that we got from those people at that time. But one thing that was very clear in Brisbane's Future Blueprint was give people more choice when it comes to housing and ensure supply for people at every stage of life in Brisbane. And that being then to create and implement a housing strategy. And we have been progressing and working on this housing strategy for Brisbane to ensure that the needs of Brisbane growing and increasingly diverse population are adequately planned for and met. As I mentioned earlier, townhouses were no longer welcome in areas intended for single homes. They want, but uh, there is still a need to supply housing choices across our city. Is it in low density for rooming accommodation? We need to ask Brisbane. Is it in uh, low medium density residential that this would be accepted? A uh, part of this is that we need to speak to the community. But the important bit is that the state government made it very clear that the approval of the townhouse ban was a condition that council would deliver the housing strategy to not only ensure we meet the needs of our residents of a city grows, but to demonstrate we're able to accommodate the dwelling targets that they have set for us as well. So the technical research and analysis has been undertaken today to support the work that looks at Brisbane of today, how we got to where we are, where we'll be in 20 years. It is going to cover a range of topics from housing trends, demands, housing stock, typology, spatial patterns, market analysis, social needs and behavioural challenges. What we know so far is that young people are staying in the home longer, Older couples are choosing to remain in their homes and more people are sharing homes in various types of accommodation. We've seen a greater diversity of dwelling types in both inner city and outer suburbs of Brisbane as well. People want to live close to services, work or education at an affordable price and in a desirable location with plenty of lifestyle and leisure opportunities, particularly after what we've seen with COVID in the last um, couple of months as well. But every resident in Brisbane requires access to safe, secure, affordable, well-designed and located housing. Now, Council is not a direct housing provider, but we do support the provision of these essential housing and championing an inclusive approach to ensure these issues are met and well considered. So based on that, we have been working... Critical. 
We've been working through the draft housing strategy. I thought Councillor Johnson, through you, Mr Chair, would be very interested to hear that we're doing the work exactly, which last week they just wanted You're to... You're still speaking to your amendment. amendment. You're not addressing my amendment. Councillor Adams, please proceed. Thank you. I'm making it very clear why we are not supporting the uh, motion that has been put forward to us today. Uh, the housing strategy for Brisbane will be out for extensive public, cons public consultation early next year. This is our opportunity to address the key challenges we are presently facing in a citywide conversation. Uh, the time to be talking about housing choices, housing preferences and housing needs for the suburbs of our city. So no, we will not be initiating a city plan amendment to remove the provisions for rooming accommodation in low density and character residential. We would take up to two years to undertake because we are already considering housing choice and affordability in the broader context of the citywide needs. We will wait to hear from the people of Brisbane on their thoughts about what we need for housing and what is best located. The community consultation that will take place early next year will be with the aim of delivering the final housing strategy mid-2021. And based on that reasoning, I put this motion lay on the table to the housing strategy has been brought back to council. No way. No, no. No, Point of chair. Uh, no, that is unreasonable. Point of order, Chair. Do, do I not get to speak as the seconder of the motion, at, at least, before this thing is put on the table? Uh, let me have a look at the rules. Give me a second. Don't be such a pain. How dare you do this to the residents? How dare you? You're not, you're going to do a housing strategy that until next year and then another two years of city plan maybe. Councillor Johnston, please allow me to address Councillor Street's point of order. Right. Scared to have a debate. Councillor Street, under the rules, the way it will work is that your opportunity to speak uh, will remain and exists when the motion is taken off the table. I have a procedural motion that, that this motion lie on the table. It's been moved by Councillor Adams. Uh, for my own well-being, can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Landers. Uh, okay. to the motion uh, moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Landers, that this resolution uh, lay on the table. All those in favour, please say aye. And raise aye. Your hand. aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. no. Thank you. The ayes have it. Division. 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 Councillor Johnson, Councillor Street, please ring the bells. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. On the procedural motion, all those in favour say aye and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Aye. Uh, thank you, councillors. And all those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Um, uh, thank you. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and six against. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. I'll now move to... Uh, no, Board of Chair. 
Point of order, Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for dinner for a period of 15 minutes, which commences only when all councils have left the meeting. Second we just had a 10 minute break. Been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor How are you doing this? It's ridiculous. I don't interject. I'm, I'm uh, putting a motion uh, that this Council now adjourn for uh, the purpose of dinner for a period of 15 minutes, beginning when all councillors have vacated the meeting. All those in favour say aye. And raise your aye. hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The eyes have it. Thank you, Councillor. D Division. You, do you actually have a Councillor Strunk, are you seconding the division? Yes. Okay, just, just ring the bells. I, I think he's trying to. Yes. Councillors, all those in favour of the procedural motion, please say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. Aye. Thank you. And all those uh, who are against the resolution, please say no, raise your hand and raise your hand and hold it there so that it may be counted. No. Thank you. Clarks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and three against. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Bye.
Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Chair. I have a petition here uh, to do with curbside collection. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a petition requesting the installation of lights for the Rody Road dog park and pathway. Councillor Allen. Uh, Mr Chair, I have a petition for cycle lanes on 864 to 905 Nudgee Road, Banyard. Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a petition to build a new skate park in the Kenmore area. Any other petitions? Yes, me. Yep, thank you. Um, just have a petition uh, for a multi-purpose covered outdoor area for Maruka. Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand. And those against say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any matters of general business? In particular, are there any matters required as a result of the Office of the Independent Assessor or the Councillor Ethics Committee? There being no one, councillors, any matters of general business? Anyone at all? Declare the meeting closed. Thank you, everybody.